I'm on my own, broken and alone. I feel the rain crashing down. All around this empty town, I'm searching for the lost and found. But you don't care, you're unaware. Keep moving like the scars aren't even there. It's in the air, like a blazing flare. Pointing, blaming you, you 
did not know oh. I thought you were the one for me That's why I give you everything As you cross by the stormy seas Oh, you meant the world to me Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Collegiate R6 and welcome to the Open League semifinals. We've got some spicy matchups on our hand tonight. As always, my name is Jay's Wills and alongside me is the man himself, the man who spends a lot of his free time zooming around the racetrack, but the man who has sped his way straight into my heart. It is, of course, G. <laughs> What an intro by the man who has the cleanest room in all of CR6. God, I, I gotta know, is that like an Ikea setup that you just like invaded Ikea and was like, I'm gonna do all my filming here from now on? Or like, how how did you set that thing up to be so perfect? Top secret information, only the select few actually know how the room is maintained. Something I'll have to tell you off the broadcast. But for now, Chief, I am super excited to actually get into this one. The first match, the first semifinal, the first teams vying for their ticket to that championship map. It will be the number one seed, Kettering University, versus the number five seed, Oklahoma State. This match has been hyped up. The amount of trash talk surrounding this match has been incredible, and the amount of, I guess, bamboozlement that we might expect to see tonight is sure to be a plenty. And by bamboozlement, I think this is a perfect opportunity to actually take a look at the rosters that we've got in front of us tonight because, you know, we've talked about how Oklahoma State have struggled getting their roster under control. The absence of Hyena has shaken up the entire roster and their really standing in the collegiate power rankings. And we can see here that Fuwa is right now in the lobby. Hyena once again absent from play. This is going to be something that Kettering are going to be looking to capitalize all night long because as everyone... Wait a uh -oh. minute here. <laughs> Fuwa has dipped out of the lobby. That's a bit concerning. And maybe they're down a player or maybe he's just restarting his PC. Chief... Oh my uh -oh. goodness. Oh my goodness. The bamboozlement that we have foretold has happened. Hyena has arrived. Oh my goodness. What a move from Oklahoma State. The reverse Uno card, the, the mind games, it's it's massive. Uh-oh, that's not good. So Kettering has been doing their homework. They've been doing their due diligence. They've been prepping for this game. They've been VOD reviewing their opponents. And all of their hard work was just thrown out the window. That one substitute, it's like watching a game of football. You're trying to review the quarterback. You know he has a certain way of throwing the ball or running the ball. And now you have a different quarterback in play. Everything that you work so hard to achieve, to obtain, all that knowledge and information was just destroyed. It was thrown away, it was set on fire, and it was burned. That's a big yikes. 
That is a big yikes. And I think your quarterback analogy is especially acute because he's actually the IGL. Hyena is the IGL of Oklahoma State, and he is going to be looking to lead his team to what could be a dominant semifinal victory, but something that, of course, like you said, Kettering are going to be looking to stop before it can even get started. Our map bands are now in front of us. We can see Villa and Coastline and Oregon are going to be the maps for tonight. And honestly, Chief, I am super excited to see these ones in play. You throw in a map like Coastline, honestly, one that I've never seen Oklahoma State actually play on here. It could be their hidden uh, secret card here that they're bringing out. I think it's going to be great to see this map pool play out. And honestly, I think we're in for a great series. We definitely are. With that, we're going to dive into map number one here on Villa. And Hyena showing his presence today. It is a perfect map to have him on. We've been talking about how IGLs are designed for Villa. It comes down to how teams are making their rotations on attack because Villa has so many different ways of taking that map control and executing upon a bomb site. Whether or not you're executing in planes and games, doing a very linear take, only taking control of study, or doing the big grandiose takes where you go from master bedroom and work your way all the way to the bomb site. Really depends on how the attacker is want to set up their rhythm and the rhythm will stem from the bands that are rolling on through as thatcher is the first one to be gone no surprise to see the emp grenade wielding sas brethren off the board i think nobody is going to be missing him there and the yana off the board though that is a very interesting pick something that usually you never see unless it is a specific target ban towards your opponent Kettering you said they did their homework and it appears two instant bans the Yana and the Mozzie the Mozzie being a target ban for Slash the man who often pops on the leaderboard and pops off in every match he sets foot in that's going to be a big pick and has obviously Slash going good night to me that's a fair point you lost your Mozzie not to mention that information denial that he brings to the table but the but the gun that Slash likes to wield that P10 Roni can be absolutely just brutal in shutting down any attacking pushes and Kettering being this their map pick. It will be OK State who starts on the defense and Kettering. The responsibility is on them to really kick things off on attack, set the rhythm like you mentioned, Chief, and really get things going on this opening map in a big way because for Kettering, what would be considered the favorites if Fuo were to be playing here, but with Hyena in play, I think all bets are off and Oklahoma State are going to be looking to shine like they have before. Of course, they are the reigning champions of the Open League. They're the reigning, they're the team to beat here. So with this full stack roster in play, I mean, they've, Attack. Kettering, have their work cut out for them to say the least. So let's go back in time. Just about a year ago, we would actually see a lot of Mozzie bans. And if we go back, the meta then was denying as much drone economy from the attackers as possible. The Mozzie pass would actively grab the drones. The mute jammers would just mute them and turn them off. And that's actually one of the reasons why Mozzie bans were in play, because teams want to do these big grandiose takes for Master Bedroom. But when all the defender utility is on the north side of the map, you're never going to be able to do that. So that forced teams to doing these very linear takes. And that's really what forced professional teams to reinforce and build up their IGLs, because they realized they couldn't just play entry fragging anymore they had to play utility and that was the start of utility consumption simulator there was a premeditated version of it and sometimes you also just need to get aggressive take gunfights just like valkyrie's doing right now yeah the run out from kanoma nearly found a kill i'd say a millisecond difference would have found at least one attacker probably papa in the early grave there but Kettering escaping an early fate but what Oklahoma State just did there was send a swift message to this attack that they are not here to mess around they are here to click heads be aggressive and make this attacking team struggle to get traction not only in this round but in the entire map attraction that we're gonna have to see unfold from this master side you've got three attackers working their way in from here the grandiose style roam that you mentioned chief the style roam clear rather working their way in from that north side and working their way up to 90 and up to the site itself derp seems to be a bit preoccupied worried that there may be a defender lurking below astronomy just a little bit but with the information there obtained by the obtained excuse me by the drone 
they'll advance up towards 90 and they will be looking to build this traction onto the site itself. You've got Bucka teasing Rappel on this 90 window, but for now, it's going to be all about that information game seeing how much resistance they are going to deal with as they approach this site. The resistance will be in the form of Inception early on, the player in 90 to hold off this push. Jay-Z, I'm a little bit concerned. Kettering is starting to get tunnel vision. They understand that they want to push from that top floor, but they haven't done their homework downstairs. There is still lurking presence, and as IQ starts to remove the utility, she has to be very careful watching her flanks, because if she starts to focus too much on her gadgetry, the Valkyrie playing so close by will be able to shut her down for free, and Nitro Cell is going to sing out. It's going to find its target. One of the best operators at dealing with that utility on the bomb site. The Ash has now been found, and the attacker, they're still working their way at destroying the on-site pressure that the defense has started to establish well kanoma is gonna get caught out and an interesting position the valkyrie not entirely sure where the iq was coming from the rome game well it backfired a little bit there for the valkyrie it's not going to for slash the head of bucca is going to be taken clean off and now the man advantage will once again swing into the hands of Oklahoma State, sitting in a 4v3, uh, an attack that it largely building its way from this 90 hall. Snappy's gonna find one, but a Hyena will find the quick response. Now a 2v3, things still going back and forth here, but Hyena has advanced into study and has eyes on the diffuser. The flashbangs are gonna rain out, but Hyena's gonna remain unnoticed and unscathed. He's gonna pop right up and find one. That's pop a P off the board. Snappy is all that remains, and Cosmic shuts it down. Oklahoma State will take round one. A good showing by the attackers. They understood exactly what they wanted to accomplish, but they weren't quite able to translate that into their final execute. And especially when they set up their 360 crossfire, they put the diffuser, the most critical operator, on an island by himself. He was tasked with holding the crossfire into study why his teammates double stacked over by 90. As soon as he fell, all the hard work that Kettering did throughout those two minutes just slipped away through their fingers. They had to push that diffuser and it really doesn't matter at the end of the day, they're gonna lose those engagements because there's just not enough time to check every single nook and cranny. And that's also how Oklahoma State likes to play. They like to utilize the entire map to their advantage and even the dying seconds, they're still gonna have more real estate under their belt than you as the attacking team. I really like that you brought up real estate because that's what we saw Oklahoma, put, Oklahoma State, excuse me, put a lot of focus on for the remainder of that round, we saw Hyena go for the retake into, into study and something that worked out brilliantly because once the diffuser was down, simply it was going to be all over for Kettering at that point. So heading over to this secondary bombsite trophy and statuary now coming to the forefront here, it's once again going to be a battle of real estate. Something that Oklahoma State love to do is extend this pressure all the way over to this south side. They will put a player in games and a player in aviator, and they will wait for the clear to come in from that south side. Something that Oklahoma State also like to do is simply just barricade every door between the study side and the trophy side just to make it more of a nuisance for Kettering to make this clear happen. The absence of a mozzie will possibly indicate towards a more passive style of roam on this side of the map but regardless of that style of roam it's going to be something that Kettering have to deal with very swiftly if they want to find attacking success here on this secondary bomb site. Now you could utilize that mute instead of the mozzie but instead we're actually going to be seeing the Valkyrie Operators that are both designed to grab information, the Valkyrie is a little bit more active information since she has her cameras, three of them that she's allowed to put out throughout the map, compared to Mozzie that has his drone denials that will grab those drones and then get packed so the defenders can utilize them as an asset. But this time, Kettering is able to find the opening duel. Slash the Valkyrie we're hyping up. He is now fallen, putting his teammate on an island. Koma is still able to win the gunfight though, but he's locked over in games. The attackers will definitely know that he's still there. There's no hope for him to rotate away so it's all on him to waste as much time as possible try to be as unpredictable as possible because he cannot get help from any members of oklahoma state 
He should be as good as dead here. After finding that kill, the attackers are soon to pressure him out, but what they're lacking here is an important crossfire. Derp is gonna push right on in, and if not careful, it could be an absolute disaster, but thankfully, the saving grace there was Papa P finding the headshot there, and at the same time, another frag rain out, and Hyena has now bit the dust. So it's a 2v4, and with Derp taking a bit of damage there, it's gonna look increasingly challenging for Oklahoma State to bring this one back. You've got Cosmic, a long angle towards Master, hoping to stall out Anomaly from pushing on in. An Inception position here in Astronomy, it's going to get increasingly challenging to say the least, but Cosmic is going to line up too, and Inception, hello! He's going to find the headshot onto Anomaly, and all of a sudden, things have completely switched around. These anchors refusing to be felled are now what the attackers have to deal with. Cosmic, a triple kill in the closing moments, and Oklahoma State will take the round on the back of their two anchor players. Oh boy, Jay-Z, that was oh not a good showing at all by the attackers. They did so many things right. They took control of planes and games relatively quickly. Now I have to put a little bit of an asterisk there. Jaeger should have been gunned down far quicker. They knew he was locked down somewhere in games. There's nowhere for him to go. You set up a triple angle crossfire, one coming from the bookshelves, one on the other side of 90, and then you have the option of swinging in vault or actually underneath the planes themselves. Jaeger dies relatively quick. You now have map control, and you still have greater than 90 seconds to slow your pace down and, again, assess how the defenders are holding that bomb site, create your crossfires, and execute. And that's exactly where Kettering went wrong. They didn't slow down. They still kept at that very fast pace, and they were playing as individuals. They're peaking as individuals. They're challenging members of Oklahoma State who are mechanically gifted. If you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a member of Oklahoma State, you have a high likelihood of losing that engagement. Remember, when you're on attack, you have to be trying to swing for 80-20 gunfights. But if you're going for 50-50 gunfights, the percentage of you winning is just not high enough. Well, that percentage of winning is going to come into effect on this tertiary bombsite, a bombsite that often favors the attackers, but once again, it's all going to be up to that early traction from Kettering and how much they can get done in how little time. We saw them struggle with the roam clear just one round ago. At least the struggle of time was a big factor. And with a vertical extension, that's going to be quite a focus here for both this defense and this attack. It is once again going to come down to how efficiently can Kettering conquer this vertical extension by Konoma, Inception, and Cosmic. It's all going to be about dealing with this utility, dealing with the manpower, forcing Oklahoma State to be on the back foot, rotate away from these hard-held positions on the top floor, and taking down Slash, something that Bucket just did, even a good night to follow it up, will assist that play to say the least. But Hyena will answer it back quickly and remove the sledge from play, and things will be even now 4v4. Look at how polite these teams are. They tuck each other in nice and neatly. They say sweet dreams to each other and move on with their days. True gentlemen in this lobby. Snappy's in a great position. He knows one's over by Deer. He's established his crossfire. Quick swing from him is going to confirm himself a kill. And one of the members of the offsite pressure has now been alleviated. Valkyrie's still up here. And as I say that, her forehead is removed from her body. And once again, Kettering is going to find themselves in a plus two man advantage. With plenty of time on the clock, they're going to have to synchronize, coordinate, and start to systematically remove the remaining members of Oklahoma State. A 2v4 can turn into a 2v2 very quickly if you're not careful, and something that Kettering we're going to have to be quite wary of. Of course, they need to play more together ever, because with a C4 that Cosmic has, and with well, the SMG-11 that they both wield, it's going to be challenging for them to, or for the attackers, to fully send it into this site unless they play together. Cosmic in Memo is wary of the push from all sides, but is also trained on the doorway that Anomaly is looking to encroach on. Still, it is a battle of the clock. The time ticking away, but with the tremendous men advantage, it's going to get increasingly easier for Kettering to make this happen. Derp. Going to even make it even easier taking down Cosmic, leaving Hyena off site in a 1v4. A retake is going to have to happen. And against four players, it's not looking too good 
for Oklahoma State in round number three. And a take from China, or possibly even a vertical take, could come through. But with the bomb going down and with these attackers ready for the retake, not to mention the air jab, throwing Hyena across the room, things are not looking good. He's going to have to attempt the impossible clutch. They don't know where he is until the pre-established drone by China confirms his location once again. SMG 11 in hand, just waiting for a member of Kettering to get aggressive and re-peek into him. He still has his utility, so opportunity cost utility won't help him at all. Snappy holding a deep angle is able to find the kill. Kettering, their first round of victory. It took them two rounds, but nonetheless, they are now on the scoreboard. They're able to win their gunfights. They've been doing it for the past two rounds, but finally, they're able to make the conversion into a true round victory they did there was was simply very well done i mean they dealt with the vertical extension in record time something that many teams can struggle to do and even a team like gettering struggled to do in those first two rounds but in round number three that was not the story whatsoever the over aggression from slash found the malusi in the early grave and things just got out of hand even further from that point forward kettering Honestly, a fantastic job of not only dealing with the top floor pressure, but assessing the situation, gathering intel, playing off each other for the execute. It's dangerous in those situations. You can get very comfortable and confident in those situations and something that can often be the thorn in the side of even the smartest attacking teams if they're not careful. But Kettering were exactly that. They maintained their cool, calm, collected nature that they are going to be looking to display all night long and they will come away with their first round. But that does mean we're going to be heading back to Aviator and Games. AVG is going to be round number four's focus. And once again, the clear from that master side is what Kettering are going to have to do very well. Maybe they won't tempt it again. Maybe it's going to be a more direct study send. But as far as Kettering have looked so far, it appears that they want to be formulaic, methodical, and clean. And if they do that again, using the speed and efficiency of round number three, things could definitely go in their favor here. Throughout this series, I've been a little bit thinking, where's Kettering's drones? Why aren't they pre-establishing? They can be so much quicker on their executes, but they finally made the adjustment. There are four drones throughout this second floor, all put in stages. So they're going to have information on every single member of Oklahoma State as they move throughout the building. That's going to provide them with the information to set up their crossfires, to pinch them, and hopefully get those opening kills that they've been so good with. And something else that I really like that Oklahoma State is doing is slashes on every single operator under the sun. He starts off with the smoke when he's on planes and games. He will move over to the Valkyrie when they go over to Trophy and downstairs he's playing that Malusi. That shows that he has a lot of versatility. He's comfortable playing every role and whatever Hyena calls, he's going to be the one to say, yes sir, I'm going to do it. Well, honestly, that's something I really like to see from Oklahoma State here. Not only, like you mentioned, Chief, the adaptability of the player himself, but honestly, I think that finding what is the key factor for Oklahoma State here, and it very well could be Slash, so making sure he's comfortable as well, changing up his role, changing up where his gun skill is going to come into effect is going to be a big key for Oklahoma State. Of course, their players can really step it up when it matters, but if you have Slash getting, you know, 15, 20 kills in a game, things are going to be made a lot easier for you, to say the least. Things are going to be made easier as well by the over-aggression from Inception taking down himself, but... Cosmic will find the quick answer as C4 from below will take out the Zofia. Papa P is going to find some shots there from the, I believe that was the drone hole, but then Hyena comes rotating around through 90. Another ballsy play, but one that finds a kill. So Kettering are stalling out here in 90, something that they struggled with last time they were here, and now they have to make that correction and get the pressure going onto the bomb site itself. Inception's kill was spurred off the information that the Maestro camera over 90 was bringing them. He was constantly being tased, tased, he being the Zofia of Derp. And that was like, Hyena's like, I wanted you to swing. I want you to get this kill. I need that opening pick. The thing was, the camera wasn't providing the information or wasn't communicating the information that, hey, he's actually looking at your position. The swing is going to be a 50-50 gunfight and you're 
might be too low of a risk to take. We can't have you swing that. Some unfortunate side of circumstances for the defense, but nonetheless, they're still at the plus one advantage and they have so little time left on the clock. It's gonna be almost impossible. Two get lined up for the Valkyrie, attempting the third and he will be successful. A brilliant showing by Oklahoma State, able to win this bomb site once again. Konoma, the perfect flank, getting all three remaining kills. Looking as it was unfolding, I'm like, okay, maybe Bucka gets killed here. I did not think that all three attackers would find the same fate. The MPX doing the dirty work in that round, and Oklahoma State finding another round under their belt here. I'm surprised that Kettering actually let that flank go off so successfully. Last time we saw Bucca identify the Valkyrie on main stairs from below and simply just one tap the Valkyrie to the six foot grave. This time they neglected to drone the downstairs area, neglected to drone main stairs or have a flank drone or an air jab set up. And because of that, the brutal flank really just shut down any remaining hopes that Kettering could have had getting that attack going. So. Going forward here, I think it's going to be increasingly important to talk about the overall picture of this match. And I just want to remind everybody how much trash talk really surrounded this one. Both of these teams have been considered the favorites to go all the way here in the Open League for, I guess, since the season really kicked into gear. Kettering undefeated in the regular season, Oklahoma State as well. The only reason Oklahoma State has had its fair share of doubters recently is because their performance without Hyena on their roster in recent weeks. They've had a couple of unfortunate losses and people have started to doubt Oklahoma State's ability to really keep things together even with or without Hyena in play. But I think Oklahoma State, they're on a mission here to change things around and prove that they are here to, to absolutely steamroll Kettering into the ground. Kettering was a team that thought they deserved to be ranked as high as Oklahoma State, even higher, but some have said that the strength of the opponents of Kettering is a bit telling. Kettering have had it easy so far, and this is that first real tester for Kettering, and if they can take a map off Oklahoma State here or take the series off Oklahoma State, it would be impressive, and it would absolutely solidify Kettering's place at the top of Collegiate Siege. The last time we we're here back in round two, Oklahoma decided that they wanted to hold planes and games extension for as long as possible. Instead, they basically set up a facade. They put the majority of their utility there and retreated. This is going to force Kettering to expend their utility and answer to confirm that there are no lurking members of Oklahoma State. But their trap card hasn't worked out well at all. Derp has pushed his way all the way up to Lamp, and now he's in the bomb site. He's actively hunting for members of Oklahoma State, but there's nobody there as of yet until one peaks. It's going to be a trade back and forth. Oklahoma State's going to be better in that scenario as they get one more trade. It seems like Kettering is just trying to push too quickly, and as a result, they're making mistakes. Well, a good call there initially. There was very little utility or information in the way of that push, but unfortunately, when the guns started to go ablaze and when the crossfire was established by Oklahoma State, Kettering were shut down before they could even get further into the bomb site and get that bomb on the ground. So now Bucca is forced to rotate around and hope to establish their own crossfire on this bomb site. Anomaly would be that player to open up this master wall, but without any possibility of removing those electro claws from the wall. It's going to be tough to actually get those Selma charges going and actually utilize the crossfire that Bucca is looking to establish. Snappy pressuring on the landing side. He'll be pressuring from here, but it's Anomaly who's actually getting the bomb down behind statues. The smoke canisters are not going to connect. And all of a sudden, we are in a post plant. Inception's going to go for the retake. He's going to sprint his way on through. Pop a toxic babe and now look for that master pressure. But the crossfire here could be big. Bucka finding the head of Slash is also going to be a big problem for Oklahoma State. Cosmic C4 finds one. Bucka, another pistol kill. Cosmic a triple is going to have to find the 4K here or go for some sort of sneaky defuse play. Bucka knows that it could be going for the defuse. He hears the call. He swings, and Cosmic's going to get off it right in time. But now Cosmic has to go aggressive. He'll go for the swing right into the R4C. And Kettering, their aggressive play on Statuary, will net them the round. Why would you be sprinting in that scenario? Rip your shift key out of your keyboard, please. 
How many times in CR6 do I say that, Jay-Z? Probably like three times a stream. It's such a bad habit to have. And it's been so many different professional players, coaches, and analysts are like, you don't need to be sprinting indoors. It's just a bad habit to have. So if you have a keyboard with shift, get your keep cap puller, rip it out, and problem solved. You can now go into gunfights with your gun up. It's a miracle. It's a huge change because instead of having a one second ADS time, your ADS time, aim down sight time is literally cut in half. Poof. Now that that rant's over, we can <laughs> kind of go back to the round, you know, get calm, cool, and collected once again. That was an upside down round for both these rosters. Kettering, they want to play this game very quickly. They want to execute quickly on this bomb site. And it does work out well for them in certain scenarios up until landing. Once they have landing control, it is imperative that they start to make a rotation. At least two attackers need to be on the side of Master Bedroom, or one on Master Bedroom and one on Astro Window. The problem is, when you have five attackers pushing in through two door frames, you're going to get slaughtered. You're not going to be able to win those gunfights because an Alda is going to be holding Mouse 1, sending 82 bullets down range, and you're going to look like Swiss cheese at the end of it. Well, notwithstanding that mistake there, I do think what Kettering did well in round number five was taking a look at what they were presented with and kind of making a call on the fly to say, hey guys, Statuary is not being contested very heavily. Let's let's get going and actually get that bomb down as soon as we can. Obviously, that had mixed results as we talked about during the round, but the Rome clear has been quick and their decision-making appears to be even quicker. They decided this time to go for that clear onto Slash, who's playing on the bottom of main stairs. Konoma was there, though, quickly to find the blow right back onto Derp. So keeping things even in a 4v4 here, but Kettering are once again looking to get map control swiftly, and they're doing so, taking down Hyena as well. The Echo, the anchor, the player meant to deny the bomb from going down is off the board here, and that's a big pick for Kettering going forward. What I love about Oklahoma State, in just about every single scenario, they're able to get refrags. Hyena falling is one of the first times we've seen Oklahoma State fail at the refrag game. Well, if they are pushing some of their utility up the red sands, that's gonna be Kakoma. He's stuck here. His position known, he's gonna have to retreat. Almost a perfect place, but he has wasted 10 seconds and that could transpire into something down the road. And that's the whole idea you have on defense. Every time you waste five seconds, you put an additional card in your deck and you can cash that down the road. Kettering in a four, two. They're in a great position to work their way on through. They're just going to have to deal with this utility and win their ones. Anomaly is going to do that, cutting down Inception, who is busy wielding that toxic babe. Konoma, though, on the retake, is going to take down the planter. Looks for the kill. A bay lines it up. The triple. The 4K. Oh, my goodness. Konoma, hello. Makes it happen. Oh, my word. Okay. That's one. That's two. There's the fourth. I mean, incredible. Someone signed this man is absolutely right. Konoma clutching it up in a 1v4 situation. Incredible play from the Jaeger. Okay, I see you, man. Stepping up when your team needs you. How often do you see a 4K and a kill cam, let alone multi transfers like that? An impeccable showing of mechanical skill. We're talking about when we are diving back and around one, Oklahoma State has phenomenal mechanical skill you can never go 1v1 with them and what did the Kettering do they're gonna be like we're gonna quadruple down on that mentality we're gonna give him four 1v1s and they learned their lesson the hard way losing their round and having it just slip away a huge oversight but fortunately for Kettering they have moved over to their defense they're gonna do a quick mindset shift and decide what is the optimal way of winning as many rounds on defense. And for them, it's going to start off with holding the, the secondary bomb site over here on Trophy with an extension into Kochek. I, Chief, I, I do really wonder how we're going to see these rounds unfold going forward because it seemed that every single round on the first half really felt, it felt very similar. It wasn't necessarily formulaic, but the rhythm of the round was... Kettering get a lot of traction early on in as quick as you could 
probably say Kettering or ask the question, what is a Kettering? They're already on the bombsite doorway. They're ready to go and attack the site. They have quick roam clears. They were pushing through Oklahoma State, and that was clearly something that caught Oklahoma State on the back foot a couple of times here and there. But then what Kettering struggled with in the same vein was actually making a execute happen once they get that clear and once they are literally on the precipice of the bomb site how do you go from there and attack the site itself something that kettering struggled with and something that maybe oklahoma could struggle with it's going to be the roam clear that's going to be the step number one the c4 from derp is going to be considered a waste after it found no target and the swing from papa although finding 90 damage will end up dealing 90 damage to the alibi as well so things going back and forth here early on but the thing here for Kettering is they still have this Rome presence they still have two players on this planes and games extension not to mention they've got Bucca using the m590 very well taking down the sledge a good opening kill for our grenades have now been surrendered and it's going to be on how well Oklahoma State figures out that there's still roaming members of Kettering on the Aviator Games extension. Derp's going to go for the wide swing. He will find his headshot and more members of Oklahoma State starting to lose their lives. One lined up. Derp was so close to dying, but Papa wasn't thrown out by you, Bar. And Oklahoma is starting to surrender more of their attacking ability one by one they start to drop and now it's hyena's turn to dry peek straight into pampa he knows he's back there he's gonna utilize an air jab to skyrocket him away but hyena goes for the quick swing and able to win that one as a closer man advantage but kettering still at a plus one these are the rounds that are so unfortunate to see teams pushing into a extension or some sort of roam and just feeding kills to those roamers it's quite un unfortunate to see because a lot of teams can struggle with that it's a part of the game that we see happen so often a lack of information a lack of ability to coordinate and establish crossfires on the fly it's something that a lot of teams struggle with and something that oklahoma state are clearly struggling to do but props to kettering for setting up and not only setting up well but coordinating well both of those roamers did an excellent job at working together snappy unfortunately will not be working together with his team any longer opting for the aggressive swing onto the statuary door and opting to find the grave relegated to camera duty for the remaining 20 seconds of the round with an execute soon to come. Oklahoma State has to take a gunfight relatively quickly to find the worst of those evils, but Anomaly is going to be the worst of those evil. He's able to get the kill. The Diffuser now surrendered. Hyena is going to have to push. He will push, but falls. He goes for another sprint challenge, losing his life. Kettering able to win their first round of defense, all off their ability to win ones on the other side of the map. Well, with the first round of the Kettering defense underway, I mean, this is a good time to generally talk about broad picture economics of the map uh, at least round economics you could say i mean this is kettering's map pick and of course you would expect them to come out strong here if they want to have any hopes in this series but on defense you'd expect them to be stronger as well teams will likely have very cohesive defensive strategies worked out especially on their own map pick so kettering we could see them make quite a comeback here that's one round under their belt and something that if Oklahoma State are not careful here. They could give way to quite a bit of momentum from Kettering because that round was pretty decisive, I've got to say. A 4v2 advantage early on, even though it eventually worked its way back with some good play from Oklahoma State. But really what I'm saying there is Kettering looked good. And if Oklahoma State are not careful, things could really continue to look like that going forward. Kettering, of course, will have to now switch to what appears to be their less favored bomb site. Uh, Aviator and games will now be the focus and again Oklahoma State are gonna have to figure out a way to efficiently deal with a roam efficiently clear it out and actually get that bombsite pressure going because that was the big struggle in round number seven for that attacking team they could not get past the study hole they could not get past that manpower and that utility used there and simply it really never could get started after that now, Slash, six picking away from the bonnet into a Blackbeard. Is that just part of Hyena's macro strategy where he's trying to have a strong operator hold a crossing whether or not on 90? Or is it more of a systematic problem where we see Slash struggling to find kills? He's currently sitting in one in one of those critical fraggers. And is this him just 
punching his ticket straight to the struggle bus and trying to find a new destination to get off the bus. We're gonna have to see how he ends up setting it up. Now, Blackbeards are great for holding angles and he can be tasked with doing exactly that over on the art side. However, there's really no defenders anywhere close to his zip code and he's gonna be forced to rotate to a completely different area. Again, Blackbeards are so strong on upside down repel. If he rotated a 90, he can get in a direct gunfight against the Rook of Dirt. Uh-oh, I think my co-caster is quickly DC'd there, so we're back over to me. Oh, I think he's back. Maybe I heard a little bit of crackle from Mr. Jay-Z. Oh, oh there, there he is. Hey, <laughs> welcome back, my friend. I'm back. I'm back into the living. Had a little bit of an issue there, but we are ready to see how Oklahoma State can mount this attack onto the bomb site. You've got Konoma working his way in from below, cooking a frag grenade, but the timing of that wasn't quite perfect, and Anomaly will escape a rough and dangerous fate. Bucket and Dirt lining a couple of kills up, taking down two, Inception a quick answer, but still, Oklahoma State are on the back foot here. Slash is just walking slowly on up through 90. He didn't get interfered with from the doorway and so now he'll be looking to take that pressure onto the site but the 416 that bucka is wielding cut down cosmic and slash is there though for the quick response but things for oklahoma state they're looking kind of dicey you've got two players remaining but you have to deal with three and you only have a minute to do so the absolute one taparuni from slash there will take down papa and make things a bit easier but the 11th man in the lobby the clock is a factor that Slash and Inception have to conquer here, and they're gonna have to work together in order to do that. The prone angle from Snappy, will, or Anomaly rather, will find Slash down but not out. The C4 not quite able to finish it off, but Inception goes for the miracle play. The sprint on into sight meets a grisly end, a shotgun delivering him to the grave as well. What was heartbreaking about that round is you called it perfectly. The attackers needed to push together, and Slash was like, nah, that ain't it and decided to push as an individual. He swung the door frame and got slammed. If he pu pushed that, did the exact same thing about three seconds later, it would have been a 180 crossfire. It would have created chaos in that bomb site. And the defenders would have had to decide which angle was it was best to challenge. And most defenders are going to say, you look one way, I look the other way, and we'll just try to win our gunfights. But when you swing as an individual like that, instead of having one attacker or one defender looking at you you have two looking at you and it really doesn't matter how good of a player you are Defenders you're likely to lose that gunfight something that was also concerning to me was oklahoma state did elect to go for that 90 repel setting up that crossfire they tasked it with their flank watch operator instead and as a result that position wasn't as powerful as it could be like we were saying at the start of round eight if the blackbeard was there it would have changed everything because a defender Defender is not going to peek a Blackbeard. That face shield that Blackbeard has is terrifying. You're never going to challenge that because the likelihood of you winning the gunfight is just so slow. Hyena needs to be a little bit better with his utility management. Five seconds left. And going forward here, and now things evened on out, the tertiary bomb site is finally going to rear its ugly head for Kettering, and the cap can will also be rearing its ugly head. A pick that you rarely see, and if you do, it's usually on this bomb site because Capcan wields a C4, and the C4 game is going to be everything for Kettering. Five T4s in pocket. Screw every other piece of utility. All they want to do is rain nitro cells up above using Papa P on that, on that pulse, using the heartbeat scanner to identify where the vertical play is coming from. And if Oklahoma State are not careful here, they will soon be sent sky high. We call this the call center from hell. That's truly an understatement there. You have to be incredibly careful wherever you walk. And Papa P is still roaming somewhat near off site, but only in a buff room over by Memo. He can be providing a lot of information, but nobody from Oklahoma State is yet 
and the vision of his wall hacking device. Bucko's gonna take a lot of HP lost, staying at below 50. He's gonna have to rotate to a different position, but he's gonna stand his ground over by the Astro Stairs, utilizing this staged room where he snipes away a drone, but the drones haven't yet confirmed him. Slash is staying in the middle of the site. He's gonna lose his life from a Nitro Cell from below. His teammate's gonna line up as well. Cosmic almost losing his life, but fortunately for him, none of the Kettering defenders are able to line up their shots. Remember, when you have so many Nitro Cells in play, you can never stand still. You can never get tunnel visioned. Well, Hyena is going to be the next victim to the vertical play. The IQ, who is already at about one HP, will no longer be a factor in round number nine. Things are crumbling here for Oklahoma State, and now with the vertical play continuing to come out, you still have three C4s ripped and tossed to the ceiling. And if you're not careful, it's going to be very painful indeed. Papa going for the shot. It's not going to happen. The C4 will not connect. Only one C4 now remains, but only 50 seconds remains for this attack to actually build the pressure on to the site itself. You've got Inception now and Cosmic pressuring from this laundry side while Konoma is searching for any sort of vertical picks with all five defenders just scrambling below and just being a nuisance into any attacker looking to build the traction onto the bomb site. Cosmic has snuck his way in below. The cover from above is there and Derp is going to challenge onto Konoma but takes a bit of damage for his troubles as well. 20 seconds to go. The bomb needs to get down. And it's not looking too good. Cosmic going for the swing. Nobody challenging initially, but there is a pulse around the corner. He knows the location. Cosmic, the AK-12, not proving its worth as Dirt finds the swing. Bucka finds a double kill. And now Konoma is all that is left. 10 HP to work with and a brutal five-man crossfire established by Kettering will end up with a flawless round for this defensive team. And well, ex excellent work for Kettering so far. Just really, really good stuff on defense. Another showing by Oklahoma State where they're playing as individuals. As soon as Slash fell, it almost looked like every single member of Oklahoma State just had question marks throughout their head. They lost their true sense of direction. I think their whole strategy was finding that opening kill in the top floor and then starting to move their attackers to the second or the first floor. The problem was as soon as they lost Slash, they didn't know what to do. They need to continue with that vertical pressure, but also have attackers, well, utilizing those holes, those pre-made holes by the attackers with those sledgehammer swings, Attack with the explosions of Sophia, and just try to work for picks. They just never did that. They seem to be just too focused on the fact that they could be blown up. You have to think about your strategy, and when you're in IGL, you have to be working through all the stages of victory. Understand, our goal is to plant over by Jukebox. Great. How are we going to achieve that? What are all those small steps to getting to that goal? And if you find a roadblock, create a new strategy or have a contingency plan so you can continue just plugging and chugging until you get to that optimal final goal. Well, the goal for Kettering is finding itself ever closer. Now the first time that they've had a lead in this one, and looks like they are continuing to put on the pressure. They've got incredible momentum now, three rounds in a row, and a flawless one at that to be round number nine. So Oklahoma State now need to recover from that swiftly, but if there's anything we know about this team, they take it one round at a time. So making a comeback is not something that they'll struggle with, but finding the traction in a round with Kettering standing in their way at every turn is something that Oklahoma State do, uh, at least they have been struggling with so far on Villa. This is a map that both of these teams can excel on when they're playing at their best, and it does seem that Kettering has simply got Oklahoma State's number right now. Now, in an effort to change things up, it's going to be a very interesting vertical style of take here from OK State. They're all coming in from below. They'll be looking to apply vertical pressure, but Bucca, the shotgun, I guess through the floor was that? That was a vertical play applied? Yeah, possibly through the hatch there. And that is going to be tough now for Oklahoma State to recover the loss of those frag grenades and the loss of the breaching hammer. Bucca, a double kill from the same position. He'll wide swing out onto the window player and cut down the ace, the only hard breacher, that Oklahoma State have elected to bring. Derp lining another one up, and things are looking really rough for Oklahoma State here. 
Look the right way, please, Sophia. Oh no, she's just lost her life. Papa finds a quick kill and slash the Blackbeard against five members of Kettering. We've been in this position before. It really doesn't matter though. Snappy finds his kill and quick fashion. Kettering has maybe confirmed that round number 10 was penultimate round. They are one round away from wrapping up Villa and moving on to map number two, which is Coastline. Well, it is looking dire for Oklahoma State here, but I've got to say, Kettering are looking quite impressive. I mean, that is, what, four unanswered rounds now, Chief? Which is Correct. not something you can usually say. I mean, that is, I mean, even on defense, I get that it's a defensive-sided map at the collegiate level for the most part, but even that, I mean, this is still impressive from Kettering. They're, they've found a way to shut down every attacking push that Oklahoma State have tried to muster. It's a little bit come to the fact that Oklahoma State are making a little bit of mistakes. The coordination on their attacks is really not as there as we would normally expect. And with that in mind, Kettering have capitalized on that lack of coordination. They're doing a great job applying a little bit of aggression, but for the most part, they're playing very methodical on defense as well as attack. And honestly, there's no indication that Oklahoma State are going to bring this one back on map number one. And remember, Kettering did their homework. But for a different Oklahoma State lineup, they weren't expecting the primary shot caller Hyena to be present today. So all their work, maybe we thought it was for nothing. They wouldn't have any strategy, but the playbooks that they wrote today, they've done a great job of reverse engineering it and applying it to the roster that Oklahoma brought out today. But with that, we're going to have to dive over to a quick five-minute break while we allow one of these players to dive back in this lobby. So please don't go back with her. Go back anywhere. We'll be back with you as soon as possible. Words are hard. From a quarter mile, I can see you at the call. Think about it, Ray won't tell you what I saw. When you break it up, you'll see who had it all.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to CR6 here in the semifinal round. It is currently Oklahoma State in match number one 
Right now, Oklahoma State is on the back foot as Kettering is one round away from delivering themselves into a victory. My partner in crime this evening is Mr. JV and our admin and deck, well, that's the legend himself, Tango Mango Down. Well, things have been looking up for Kettering recently. They are continuing to just put on a show for us tonight. They've won four rounds in a row and they show no signs of slowing down. Taking away it, what looks like it could be a map from Oklahoma State here, that would be that would be pretty big against a team that is favored to take all to, to take it all the way, a team that has been looked at as the best open team for the entirety of this season. Well, it would be a big start to this series. Going to Coastline next, of course, we've got a couple of rounds to finish up here, but Chief, I think this is a good time to talk about Coastline because this is not a map that we have seen from either of these two teams, I think, for the entirety of this season. I've got a little bit of inside information here. Oklahoma State Ooh. have said, this is a map that we've never played. And we want to bring it out and just absolutely bamboozle Kettering. So they've been stratting on it. They've been scrimming on it almost every night of this week. But you've got to consider that going to an unknown pick is always a dangerous move. And this could be just what Kettering needs to take this one here. What do you think? That type of strategy has worked before. We saw it out of the old In Control Nation roster back in SCL. They hid Cafe. They didn't play it through all of the season. And all of a sudden, in the grand finals, they bring out Cafe. They ended up 7 owing their opponents of Unreal Nightmare. Now, In Control Nation, they would change their name to Down to Earth just recently, and they would bring out that exact same strategy, where they would hide a map and the map they hid was Coastline, but it really didn't work out for them. They ended up going into a quadruple bracket of overtime, and the score, I believe, in the end was 10 to 8. The problem is you can bring out new strategies to Coastline, and Coastline isn't a map that is particularly strategic forward. You can win a map purely based on mechanical skill, purely based on winning gunfights. So if you're going to go for the strategy where I'm going to not play this map, I'm going to save strats, Coastline I don't think is the map to do it on. Do it on any of their six maps and you could probably be successful and lethal. Coastline, not so much. Yeah, I mean, both of these teams, you mentioned the gun skill, and I think both of these teams are I mean, maybe not evenly matched, but they're both up there in their ability to just frag out and go into coastline where all bets are really off. You said it's not a strat-heavy map, it's a frag-heavy map. So I think that's a perfect point. I think it could be quite dangerous for Oklahoma State deciding to go there, especially when they're starting things off, at least what appears to be on the wrong foot here, sitting at six to four, staring down match point. This is a situation that Oklahoma State have been in time and time again, but it is also one that Kettering have been in time and time again. They have gone completely undefeated regular season. Playoffs, they have steamrolled the competition on their way here, and they have showed no signs of slowing down. So Kettering are used to being in this tremendous lead. They're used to holding match point over the heads of their opponents and what they've done week after week is hold it over their opponent's heads and win it right away. They do not allow their opponents to claw back in and build their momentum back. Something that if you allow Oklahoma State to do, it's going to get very dangerous for you very quickly. But so far, Kettering are looking good. And well, Oklahoma State, their responsibility now. It's their responsibility to find two rounds on Villa. The only two rounds that they would have found on attack on this map if they want to send it to overtime and maintain the hopes of taking Kettering's own map pick off their hands. And I'd love to see how Coastline's going to change with the new season or the mid-season reinforcements rolling out. There is a few changes particularly being made to Buck. So instead of having 26 shells in his shotgun, he's now going to have 30, which doesn't sound like it's a big change, but it's an additional mag. 
and that's going to allow him to utilize more of that vertical destruction, particularly when the defenders are playing in hookah. You send your buck underneath into the blue bar, and he will start to shred the entire floor. One of the most powerful posi positions on that map is smoke spot right between the default plant and the wall, where the smoke's going to be throwing that toxic babe on the wall itself, having it detonate, and that smoke is going to propagate, defying all types of physics and logic, clip through the wall, and start to choke the attackers on the other side. But if you bring a buck, who's now recently been buffed, into that position, he can remove the entire floor away from the smoke, who won't have the option of playing there. One of the primary avenues of denial for the defense won't be there. And also, you don't really need a hard breacher on coastline so you can bring out the new buck that pocket thermite charge which opens a small can opener sized hole but if you need to make a quick entry point that could be great utility as well well i'll ignore the fact that you called the secondary hard breach a can opener as it it's should a be called. you're right as it should be called no no i i loved that you called it that and we're and we're just gonna leave it there chief we don't even have to no, discuss it's a trampoline. that today it's a trampoline <laughs> my, my apologies you, do you know what you know what it's okay. I'm going to go with what you said first. You said can opener. I'm happy with it. I'm ignoring all this discussion and we're going to get right back into Villa. So the double rehost now completed and the defense, the defensive performance from Kettering soon to be completed as well. Before we get into this round, Chief, there is one question I want to ask you. It's a little bit about Echo here because we've actually seen a quite a bit of Echo from both of these teams, specifically Oklahoma State on their defense brought out here on Villa and I'm wondering what you think about not only his viability since his rework, but especially since the midseason reinforcements. So yeah, his time, his what his stun time has gone down from 20 seconds to 16 seconds. His time where his drone needs to jump went down from three seconds to two seconds. Those are quality of life changes. They're going to make him a little bit more viable. But the reason we are seeing him played earlier was most likely for his deployable shields. Deployable shields are an incredible asset the defenders have. Plenty of defenders have lost their deployable shields in favor of other utilities simply because they're, well, the apex point for many defenders' macro strategies. And sure, Echo's going to be receiving a little bit more play, but I don't think the rework changes that rolled out yesterday are going to be that big of a change for him. It's just going to be quality of life. All right. Well, that makes a good bit of sense. I mean, his play has not seen, I guess, too much, too much action since he was released from quarantine, but it's an operator that I'm always interested to see how teams are going to start to use the operators that have been reintroduced or introduced for the first time because it's great to see the creative minds of teams at work and exactly what their priorities are when making a strat and how they really want to carry it out. It's always great to see. And what we are going to see here in round number 11, though, it's going to be Derp going for some early challenges over on this master side. He's rocking the P90 with a 1.5 instead of the MP5 with the two times scope. And regardless, he's going to find the headshot onto Inception and give Kettering the edge early on in round number 11, the edge that maybe they needed to go ahead with this victory. Now, Despite being down at low HP, Derp having rotated back to site, Kettering now, or Oklahoma State rather, they're staring down five hungry defenders on the bomb site. The roam, the early aggression has paid off for Kettering. Now it is simply wait for the push to come through and wait for the 90 control to be obtained by Konoma. That's exactly what Konoma will get done, removing Derp from play finally. And now it's going to be about cascading that pressure onto the bomb site, made ever harder by the 416, cutting down one. Sadly, the P90 fell earlier in the round, and Bucka will now fall as well. And for those of you who are not familiar with Rainbow Six Siege or are newer to the game, utilizing the P90 is like bringing a dumpy car to a drag race. It's like having a Prius and racing a Ferrari. It just doesn't work. And if you get a kill with that gun, it's like giving somebody the middle finger without actually giving them the middle finger. But nonetheless, trades back and forth in this round. Everybody at equal man count as it's two on two apiece. Slime is at very low HP, sitting at about 10. He is one is sliver away from death. Any amount of utility that gets caught in his body will be his undoing. But fortunately for him, he still has those face shields. So he can tank a headshot. And if he utilizes it appropriately, he can swing and hold angles very effectively. But he's going to be a little bit passive, at least as of now. 
Kyle is going to be looking to swing on up. A couple of pot shots taken over towards Papa there behind the bar. But Anomaly and Papa, they remain stalwart on this game side. Anomaly tempting a swing, possibly out towards this push. And Slash, he actually might see the backpack of the Maestro there, who's just sneaking around on the side. He's going to be going back and forth, wielding that Alda, and Cosmic's going to cut him down for that mistake. Anomaly lines one up. The ping is there. He's going to look for the wall bang, but it's not going to line up. And Cosmic and Anomaly are now caught in a 1v1. Cosmic now fighting for Oklahoma State's life on this map, and he's going to make it happen. He'll cut down Anomaly and give OK State round number 11. He should have gone for the Nitro Cell. He had the red pings. That would have been a free bit of information. But what was concerning to me was the fact that they, again, had a camera over in the game's bomb site. It was providing hunt information. But where was the information the attacker had rotated over into the gun vault? He eventually got it, but it was about a second too late. He ended up going for the pre-fire. That was free information, Oklahoma State. And they're able to convert that into a great round victory. And that was another round where Kettering was able to get the opening duel, and by some miracle, Oklahoma State just wins their ones, converts it into a victory. However, they're still not out of it yet. We're currently going over to round 12, and Kettering is at match point. If Kettering wins this round, we end Villa here and now, and we'll move over into map two. But if Oklahoma State is able to win this round, we will move into overtime, where we'll have three rounds to confirm the victor here in map one, and then finally make that rotation to map two. Well, Chief, the last five rounds, we've done a lot of talking about the mistakes that Oklahoma State has started to make and the success that Kettering has found. But in that last round, I think we're going to have to say the exact opposite because the early footing that Kettering found was tremendous. They found two early picks. They found one extremely good pick over on the master side with the Rook, the P90 that we've talked so much about. But despite that, they threw away their man advantage by getting over aggressive. The Rook did not have to return to 90 Hall and make a swing at those players pushing in from landing. And Bucca did not have to swing out on the game's door as well. Two mistakes, critical mistakes, took a man advantage that was in the hands of Kettering, neutralized everything, and made Oklahoma State. They had a fighting chance in the round, and Cosmic did what he does best. He'll take a fighting chance and turn that into a victory. Hyena now will be pressuring on from the pantry stairs, looking to deliver that victory to OK State. There's a player with a shotgun in the corner, but he does not win the gunfight. The trade is there, though. Slash playing close to his teammate and making it happen. The recovery is swift. So Oklahoma State maintain that 4v4 situation here. But Papa, oh my goodness, the C4 raining from above will cut down the IQ and a big pick on the board. A change for Oklahoma State. They're electing to go for a linear take. The last time they went for this bomb site, they did the vertical take and got slammed. So Hyenas identified a change. But he started to skip steps in his early execution of this round. He wasn't droning out all those small positionings. And as a result, two members of his roster has lost has lost their life. But they're still able to get those refrags. So both of these teams stuck at three men apiece. A great rotation working their way on through. Shots back and forth. But nobody even able to land up their shots. They're going to prompt a Nitro Cell to get gripped and ripped. It will find its target this time. And Kettering is back in their man advantage a position that they're constantly in they're very comfortable here but they only have one nitro cell remaining bucka just tucked away here close in memo wielding a pistol hoping to i guess bm oklahoma state into the dirt but it's inception one kill now that's two for him on the round lining up anomaly bucka cut down as well by cosmic inception looks for the swing but it's dirt who wins the gunfight again it is a 1v1 with cosmic and cosmic makes it happen oklahoma state will take round 12 and force overtime even when it looked so dire it was four rounds in the row for Kettering, they were looking phenomenal on defense. They looked unstoppable. And all of a sudden, a re-host applied the brakes harder than they could react. The car started to spin, and they found themselves in a tree, crashed right in front of Oklahoma State, able to capitalize on every single mistake that Kettering is making. Now, in both these rosters' defenses, everybody seems to be making mistakes. But at the end of the day, when you're playing in a round, the heat of the moment, it's whatever roster is able to 
to mitigate those mistakes, able to correct those mistakes, and have a contingency plan tends to win. And if we're looking at it, Kettering, they will remain on defense in overtime, which is a stronger position since the defenders seem to be winning the majority of these rounds, 4-2 splits for each of these rosters. Well, the one round at a time mentality from Oklahoma State, well, it's sure shining through here in these last few rounds. I think you said it perfectly, Chief. The breaks that the rehost applied, the momentum that immediately got shut down from Kettering and all of a sudden it's overtime and Oklahoma State have just won two attacking rounds in a row. They're gonna have to do that very thing again. At least one of those attacking rounds they're gonna have to find as they head over to overtime and start on the attack. But right now, things are looking good for them. Kettering aren't even making that many mistakes, at least in that last round. We didn't see a lot of over aggression. Kettering corrected that mistake, at least on that front, but the coordination from Oklahoma State was simply too much for Kettering to handle. Each each defender from Kettering was kind of on an island, isolated from one another, and because of that, Oklahoma State took each gunfight methodically, set up crossfires, and eliminated each defender in those hard stuck positions. So a brilliant job there to, for Oklahoma State to take the round on that first floor bomb site, but going upstairs to Trophy and Statuary, the site that Kettering have found themselves generally undefeated on i believe so far things i guess could be tough here for oklahoma the vertical play here from bunka is going to find a kill and once again kettering find themselves up a man all the advantage in their favor here that is the third individual to be lost in that exact same position. Bucka has been here before. He slaughters you if you work your way from jukebox the fact that oklahoma state has been yet able to even realize that power position as a threat is very concerning and they're gonna have to fight with a man disadvantage both of their frag grenades have now been surrendered some of those most important positions the most important operators at breaking down power position destroying those deployable shields won't be able to participate in this round stop dry peeking into bucka when he's in that position now fortunately for slash he's gonna start to heat up he was very quiet in the first 10 rounds but after round 10, he has woken up. He started to win his gunfights. He's still going to have to win a few more of them before we can crown a victor. Well, Inception is looking for the angle here onto Derp and the over-aggression there peeking into that angle when even Oklahoma State were overly prepared for that. Well, that's going to cost Kettering one of their defenders. Things have evened out into a 3v3, a dangerous situation for Kettering still, but equally so for Oklahoma State. The time is working against them. They have very little intel and they've just lost their Havana. Papa making the shots happen, taking down the ex Kairos pellet wielder to the floor, but thankfully a quick escape and a quick revive is going to keep things even here as we get into the closing moment. Slash Looking for a couple of pot shots onto the site, hoping to connect with anybody, but Snappy has since moved. Papa is simply prone and waiting, and Inception now rotating around to this statuary site. Goes for the swing, doesn't know that Snappy is here. This would get quite dangerous. Cosmic going for the plant, Snappy for the swing and getting shut down. Slash lines up another, cutting down Papa, and Bucka is all that remains. He'll cut out down Slash, who is going for that rotation, the triple kill on the round, and to win this one, Bucka's gonna find the elusive ace on the round. He's going to push in from Master, looking for anyone in this post plan, but the attackers are playing this well. They've backed off. They're playing this passive, and Bucka has to go for the over-aggression here. He's got to go for the crazy swings. He's going to hope the Toxic Babe can do it. He's going to go for the defuse while the Toxic Babe is going out, but Buck is going to light up the quad kill. There's another, and now it's going to be all up to Inception, who's very low HP and is forced to swing this angle. Playing the time wisely, though. The Havana just waiting. <gasps> Buck finds the ace, but he doesn't have enough time. Oh my goodness, he's out of time. He gets the ace, but he can't secure the round. What an ending. Buck and nearly made it happen. Goodness, I am speechless. There is a half a second left on this diffuser. If he switched to his secondary weapon, would you run faster out? And if he didn't hit his crouch key, he could have made it. It would have definitely been close, but it would have been more winnable, I should say. Phenomenal mechanical skill effort shown by Baka. 
He is a great player. He proved it in that round. But remember, you have to still defuse. You may slaughter all the attackers, but you have to eventually get back to that nest egg. And now, Oklahoma State is going to find themselves on defense. They're going to find themselves hyped up and fired off after a brilliant showing in a previous round. A round that they shouldn't have shown or won. They made mistakes. They're able to come back together as a team. And this is probably the most important round. What State does now will dictate the rest of the series. So I can't believe we're sitting at this point on Villa. I mean, for Kettering to have had a two round lead and to be on match point, and then for Oklahoma State to say, we don't care, we're gonna win three rounds in a row and absolutely steal the momentum from under you, an incredible statement here to say the least from OK State and well an ending to Villa that is surely going to go down in the storybooks. I mean Bucca getting an ace but just narrowly missing the defuse. Just it's tough stuff to really come back from if you're Kettering. I mean imagine being Kettering in that moment. You your teammate just got an ace. Your teammates riding sky high feeling great with the confidence and the momentum but then you're out of time and you lose the round anyway, a round that may have been the most important round we've seen so far on Villa because Oklahoma State now have not only taken back the lead, but now they're staring down match point of their own. One more round for this defensive team now and Coastline is map two and Kettering are fighting for their lives on their opponent's map pick. And to rub Saul in the wound more, Kettering, their ace up their sleeve was that secondary bomb site of Trophy. They've been able to win it every single time, except for probably the most important showing of that round 13. But it's a new round. It's a new day. It's going to be how Kettering elects to take this map control. They have to be very wary. There's very, there's very many members of Oklahoma State throughout this map roaming around trying to be as much of a nuisance as possible. It's going to be coupled with their utility, particularly those black eye cameras over by 90. Grabbing information and another strong start to the round as Slash finds the opener. Well, Oklahoma State looking to continue that momentum. Inception going to do that by cutting down Papa on the swing, but thankfully the Jackal, at least for Kettering's sake, will be back on the board. The C4s are going to pop on out. Konoma not going to find a kill with at least that C4, but Cosmic, who's found a C4 kill every time they've gone to this bomb site, is going to be looking for another one. Inception has re-aggressed and has now taken back control of 90. A couple of shots towards landing will not find their target, and then he will wisely retreat and back on off, but crossing the 90 second mark. Kettering have made progress, but they have not actually burned utility, gotten that information and made progress onto the site itself. They're now rotating around to master to go for this two pronged approach, but you've got Inception carefully around this corner, lurking with that 416 and hoping to make it even harder for Kettering to make this push happen. Inception taking a bit of damage there, but retreating off for the time being, and now just waiting for his moment to strike. Bucket gonna take a bit of damage and Evil Eye doing that. Cosmic lining one up. Inception finding another, a 2v5 now. Kettering the match on the line. Snappy with a quick repel on in, a miracle shot, but he will land it. It's gonna prompt members of Oklahoma State to start to send their nitro cells down range. None of them will connect. And well, more members are gonna start to fall for Oklahoma. They were doing so many things right in this final round, or what's starting to set up to be the final round, but they have to play together as a team. They have to be a unit. Hold your ground, swing angles together, and more importantly, utilize those toxic babes of Slash. He just sent one down range. He sent his final one. 10 seconds of denial, but it will mean still 10 seconds left on the clock. A free entry for Kettering, and if they find more of those engagements, it's getting even more free. But Cosmic on a quick, quick swing over to the bomb chassis denies the bomb planner himself, and it's going to force Snappy to go to his pistol. Looking ring around the rosy, trying to find one. The vault over the U bar will be successful and now it's gonna be on snappy to find slash but as we dive into zero zero overtime slash just needs to find the headshot which he will do with ease and oklahoma state able to have the comeback on kettering's map pick quite a comeback and quite a victory for oklahoma state they will go ahead to take kettering's map pick to their own map pick of coastline where honestly i think it's going to be just as 
close. Incredible stuff from both of these teams. Well played on both sides. We saw momentum. It was a big momentum-focused game. We saw a handful of rounds go to Oklahoma State's favor. Kettering, a tremendous comeback. They took the advantage four rounds in a row and then flipped around. The rehost changed it all four rounds in a row for Oklahoma State as well. Great stuff so far What is what we've seen. And honestly, I cannot wait to see what we are going to see on Coastline. It's going to be an incredible map. I'm sure we're going to see some fragging, and I'm sure it's going to get spicy. But until then, we're going to take a quick five-minute break, 10-minute break, and we will be back in just a few moments. So stick around. This one is just heating up. See ya.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Thanks for sticking with us, and we are ready to get back into this incredible semi-final series between Kettering and Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. Map number one was incredible to witness, and Oklahoma State squeaked out an overtime victory, that 8-6 to six final score being delivered on Kettering's map pick and going forward to Coastline. I know we're going to see some incredible siege as well, Chief. Thanks for joining me again on the desk. How are you feeling about map two? I'm feeling wonderful now. I'm not feeling too great about these bands. That's kind of interesting. The bane of Kettering was Blackbeard and the bane of Oklahoma State was Jackal. So instead of doing these traditional bands where you remove operators that are going to hurt your macro strategies, at least directly, such as like a Thatcher or a Hard Breacher, you're going to remove comfort operators. That will allow you to have a little bit less pressure when you're roaming, or the Blackbeard so you could swing an angle and guarantee yourself a headshot. Well, Mai is a strong ban, even though he has recently been nerfed, losing his deployable shield and the Mozzie we saw in map number one that is a direct counter to Slash, and it was working out pretty well for them in all things considered. Yeah, and something also that worked pretty well, I guess for Oklahoma State, was their roam and the loose style of play that they chose to display for the most part of Villa, I'd say. They found that 4-2 to two defensive split on Villa, something that used to be very common, but has become increasingly elusive as the map finds itself a little bit more attacker sided and going forward to a map that really lends itself to a very loose style of play both on attack and defense i think that could really play into oklahoma state's hands here now just to remind everybody exactly how we ended up here i mentioned this inside scoop a little bit earlier but oklahoma state this is one of their maps that they really haven't played all season long this is one that kettering definitely could not have expected oklahoma state to elect to go to here and so bringing out this i guess dark horse style pick from oklahoma state it's their way of hoping that it can give them every possible edge over kettering but a concern that you mentioned chief was one that usually you want to pull out those interesting strategies on a map that is more strat heavy and coastline is quite the opposite you know, Jay-Z, I'm heartbroken right now. Look at what Gun Derp is running. He doesn't have the P90 anymore. I quit. YOLO. I'm out of here. But, I mean, in all things considered, the MP5 is a phenomenal gun. It doesn't have its ACOG anymore, but it still has a two-time sight. However, the man wielding that gun is going to be caught out, droned out, and now dealt with relatively quickly. Derp was on an island, and all of his utility has now been lost. His impact grenades could have been very good for his rotations throughout the round, and now he's going to have to rely on Papa P, who is known over by the pink bar. Able to find one, though, but finally finished off, as it seems like Oklahoma State already understands how to execute on this map, but this map can be attacker-sided. Well, the reason this map can be attacker sided is well it's there's so many avenues for attackers to approach this building there are countless entry points countless avenues for you establish those crossfires onto all of not only the bomb sites but even roaming positions and that's how we just saw oklahoma state swiftly conquer the roam that papa and derp were attempting to bring out of course that's not quite over yet you still have bucka who's downstairs in security waiting to make his presence felt and something that Oklahoma State are going to have to swiftly deal with. But you can see, the four ping is there. Slash knows exactly where the bandit is positioned. And Bucka will get cut right on down by the Ash of Slash. So things are looking good for Oklahoma State here. A 4v2 advantage, leaving Anomaly and Snappy, the remaining defenders, to hold down this bomb site. Now, fortunately for Kettering, they do have those two toxic babes left for Anomaly. That's going to be a little bit of denial time, but bullets do a much better job of that. And here's Anomaly stuck in an impossible position and able to find one. But it's twisting around, looking in every direction. He doesn't look in the right one and eventually felled Oklahoma State, able to win the round in quick fashion, dismantling every bit of offsite pressure that Kettering delivered. Well, it was quite a loose style of play from Kettering and one that was really just did not play into their overall macro strategy. I mean, leaving two players on site to hold it down ended up being the incorrect decision, at least in that round one defense. You saw three 
defenders playing extensions and playing that loose style that I've talked so much about already. But the problem was they weren't playing together. Each defender was extended and they were on an island all by themselves. First, it was the offices player. Then it was the Sunrise player. Then it was the main lobby player. Each felled by their own accord, getting cut down by a roam clear by good information game from Oklahoma State. They had good pre-placed drones. They had good flank watch and they shut down every possible flank that Kettering chose to implement. So going upstairs to bomb site number two, it's gonna be Hookah and Billiards now in play. And it's going to be up to Kettering to make a necessary adaptation, change things around, either play a bit closer to the site, or if you're playing that extension, play a bit closer to your teammates so you can play the refrag, something that uh, Oklahoma State did so well in round number one. So we're talking about whether or not Buck would be utilized, and here he's being shown. But instead of being shown with that new pocket thermite charge, he's going to be bringing out those traditional sets of flashbangs. And I love this aggressive style of play that Oklahoma has. And Lion is a phenomenal operator in every sense of the word. He's always providing information to the team. If he gets those red pings, well, that's visual information in front of you. But if you're not getting red pings, that's still information because you know the defenders aren't rotating. And you couple that with a strong drone strategy, that information and the lack of pings can be even more important. You set up your crossfires, you go for broke, and you win your ones. Papa's going to attempt to win his ones. He almost lines up the shot, but the crosshair was placed a little bit too high. Derp drone out over on the security side. He'll be forced to rotate away. First lion ping is going to go off, but there's no kills to answer it back for Oklahoma State. Inception looking to make it happen, looking to find the Malusi who has been so elusive so far. The pings are there, and it's in fact going to be the Bandit who is the first player to be cut down. That is Bucka off the board. Derp hoping to be the saving grace for his team, finding the refrag, but it will not be found, and Inception and Slash will both escape unscathed, and Cosmic, holding this angle on the roof, will be looking to cut off any rotation that Derp might attempt as he works his way back towards the bomb site. Inception's job here, typically the buck will come from below pink bar and swish cheese the entire floor of the bomb site, even Hookah as well. That's exactly what he's doing right now, forcing any anchors out of those positions, and actually Derp, he goes for the big flank, and there was no flank watch. Now, Konoma will have to be the person relegated to that flank watch and drone duty for the remainder of the round now that he's been cut on down. Papa finding another, cutting down Slash with that 416, making his presence felt here in round number two to make things even harder for Oklahoma State to find their traction. Inception falling as well. Anomaly, some good vertical play there. Looking good for Kettering here on the second round. Good positions to be in, but they're going to still have to be very conscious of what that clock is telling them. Derp on the run out. He's been spawned out. Jiggle peeking around the door frame. He will find his kill. The diffuser now surrender on the other side. The map, the south side over by offices. And Hyena's going to have to do the impossible. Finding four more frags with 40 seconds left on the clock. He does have two flashbangs left, coupled with those two lion calls. So it's going to be possible, but Papa ends all hope. Kettering able to win round number two off their ability just to flank. Ace has been shown sometimes on coastline, but the opportunity cost of bringing the ace at hard breach gadgetry is the lack of true flank watch. Yeah, Oklahoma State, despite doing it so well in round number one, in round number two, it was their very problem. Kettering, utilizing flanks very well, utilizing aggressive roam very well and despite not playing as together as you normally would like to see they individually played a lot stronger as players on their own roam we saw derp on the malusi he shot a couple of drones rotated back to site he gave oklahoma state a sense of false comfort that the malusi would no longer be a problem to deal with on that first floor but sensing that, Derp decided to rotate back down the white stairs, rotate back around to security, and he played a couple of good frags, giving Kettering an edge going into that entire round. And from there, it was one by one, the defenders just finding their picks, a couple of peaks onto the aqua bounce, some peaks over onto the vertical play, and all of a sudden, Oklahoma State was, was out of the round before they could even get back into it. So in round number three, Kettering will be looking to further that success, of course, but have to be careful 
to not fall victim to the very same aggressive take that Oklahoma State brought through in round number one. What's concerning to me about Kettering is how they elect to hold the other side of the map over by the west, the Pink Barn. They're constantly putting one player there on an island where he can get shut down for free. A couple of that with those line E, 1D scans, and it's starting to look terrible. But the round has just started and nothing can be set in stone as of now. We're going to see Kettering go for the exact same peak they did in the previous round, challenging the Aqua Hatch. Now, hopefully Oklahoma State has done their due diligence actually droning out that position. Shots were fired, but that's going to show that everything has been relinquished other than the office sign. One kill going in favor of Slash, but immediately refranged. Papa is now down and out. So good showing by these teams. However... Has the utility gone in favor of the defense? Absolutely, since Ash was the one that was lost. Well, as things continue to unfold here, just about to pass that 60-second mark burned off the clock. It's going to be up to Oklahoma State here and what they can really make happen with the time slowly ticking away. Clearly, there's a lot of pressure mounting from the side of Sunrise Bar. Another E1D drone going out. That's going to enable Hyena to start to push on through on the bottom of Cool Vibe Stairs. The information is there, and that's what's going to end Fine Derp in the grave. The Malusi going for another security flank is not going to pay off. Bucca, another player on this roam, but should probably start falling back to site to support the team because you've got a f push that's looking to get underway onto this bomb site. Inception clearly wary of the presence of any other roamers, but Anomaly and Snappy are simply just holding down this site with their lives at this point. The last two remaining roamers, Bucca on the flank here, working his way through the blue bar. He's gonna find one, he's gonna find two. That's a double kill and a huge momentum swing for Kettering now. Inception, he's gotta go for the find of the, the frag here, but he's not gonna find it. He's gonna find one HP, oh he does. The pistol will line up the headshot and finally, Bucca cut down Despite the interesting gunfight that just unfolded, it will be a 2v2 with 60 seconds to play. Oh, geez, you're so polite. Most of us would have called that a potato fest, but you're right. It was quite interesting to say the least. Oklahoma State having to push through doorways that are current being currently being watched by the double SMG 11 bros of Kettering. They're going to be holding this fort for as long as possible. An SMG 11 or a shotgun grabs one whiff of that buck and he will be felled for free. Smoke grenades are going to start to remove those powerful positions, but they don't hear the vault until now. Anomaly just firing a shotgun into the abyss, able to find nothing at Oklahoma State. Off the switcheroo, the 180 crossfire, they just walk in and win their one a huge round and a huge turn of events for Oklahoma State. I mean, this is something that we've seen from OK State all night long. Just an equal man count. It's getting down to the wire on attack, the clock ticking away, and somehow, by some miracle, they're able to pull it out. I don't really think Kettering are making many mistakes here. Simply good play by the attackers is is lending themselves to coordinated pushes and coordinated onslaughts of aggression that are just cutting down these defenders another impressive performance from them and that will give them their advantage and they will take round number three going forth on coastline on a map that can often be attacker sided it depends the way the winds are shifting in a particular evening it's going to be up to kettering once again how they can make the adaptation they showed that they could do it. They lost one round and then they came immediately back to win one on their own on their own token as well. So going forth to round number four, you've got to see a change here from Kettering. Whether that is more on-site fresh or more together roam presence or simply better awareness as roamers, I really don't know what it could be. But you've got to be aware, at least for Kettering's sake, that Oklahoma State are starting to correct their flank, wash, flank watch issues that they've been having. They're more aware that Kettering are going to come up on their flank at every possible opportunity. And so going forward, you'd expect Oklahoma State to continue that their, their prowess in that regard, and you'd expect Kettering to figure out a way to change it up. You're heading over to the tertiary bombsite. It's Blue Bar and Sunrise now making its semifinal debut. And the way that Kettering are playing this seems like it's the way they've been playing many other sites. You've got Bucca on this extension. You've got Snappy, and you've got Papa also on the extension and you're leaving Anomaly all alone on the Sunrise site. 
So there's a niche strategy that I'm not sure that it's made its way into collegiate play. But when you're on defense and double bars, you expand over to kitchen, which is very common. However, you actually make your bomb site a little larger and actually expand into the kitchen prep itself. You make small murder holes, and if Mira is available, which she is, you place it on one of the walls by prep on a very long angle, looking into quad wall over into blue bar. Or you can also win your gunfights like Bucket did. That's also an option you have. But that strategy is great for denying plant from the south side of blue bar. Most teams are electing to you know not go through a hard breacher so that plant never is viable because they can never open up the south double wall but since oklahoma state loves to bring out that ace that plant that we don't see ever is now viable which is going to force kettering to possibly change up their strategy to deny it in abnormal ways well they'll be looking to use this man advantage to just continue to put the pressure on this attack with one player off the board it's going to be hard to allocate as many resources to the flank watch to the droning to get your team into sight so things are going to get even more precarious for this attack as they get on towards this bomb site and kettering are looking even better as the clock continues to tick away you've got derp positioned out here towards the main lobby side and you've got bucka holding an interesting angle here over in courtyard papa as well all of these players extended off site, but it's feeding into the strategy that this bomb site allows you to. It plays like an entire map as one bomb site because you need control of almost every bit of this map to get an execute going. That's exactly what Derp is going to prove. The vertical play, too much for Inception to handle. The man who created the angles himself will fall to the very same thing. Konoma looking for the answer, but these defenders are playing really brilliantly right now. They are just waiting for Oklahoma to walk into their open arms, and Oklahoma State are not doing that right now. Hyena, he's going to have to do it first. He's going to drop right on in as Derp lines up one onto Konoma. Hyena looks for the shots on one, and he will get one down, but not before Papa can make his presence felt as well. Cosmic in a 1v3. He just found two, but he's going to need the ace to pull this one out. 20 seconds, he's gonna start to put the bomb down. Kettering doesn't have the information until it's almost too late. Cosmic has confirmed it. He's able to win one, he's down but not out. This round has gone in favor of Kettering. Great fashion, it's going to be a free defuse for them. And I was gonna be very critical of Oklahoma State and their inability to really use hard breach effectively. The way they're utilizing it is like, all right, we're gonna send two of those Selma charges on the top patch, that gets opened up. And I was waiting for Mudroom to be open up they ended up doing it with about 30 seconds left on the clock there was the no denial in that position at all for kettering and i would have actually liked to see oklahoma state open that up sooner at the start of the round even because again if you think about how you're going to be working your way through a checklist that is a potential that you have for a primary plan spot we talked about the other one in the blue bar but you want to have as many contingency plans as possible so you attempt to plant behind the b bomb chassis and in the event that Ace dies early on and he didn't open up the mudroom wall, you're kind of SOL in that position. And also, remember, Buck has been reworked. You have the option of bringing out that pocket thermite charge. And if you drop the Ace in favor of Buck with the pocket thermite charge, you can finally bring a true dedicated flank watch, which, in fairness, Oklahoma State is now finally bringing. Well, they're also going to pull out the Capital. Hyena bringing out the Firebolt wielding operator now, so that could feed into this strategy, really revamping their entire attacking lineup now. You've got Slash bringing out the Twitch as well, so deciding to really change things up here to try to find some more traction in this one going forth to round number five, another Hookah and Billiards defense. But what Kettering have been doing so well, really, is... Is, is adapting on the fly. I mean, they've been doing it all night long. And of course, in map number one, Oklahoma State found their advantage, at least at towards the end of that map. But honestly, what Kettering just did in round number four, instead of feeding kills to Oklahoma State like they had been doing in the previous rounds, they didn't do it that time. They played passive on the bomb site and waited for Oklahoma State to make the first move. It was very clear by the way that Oklahoma State's attack really stalled out in that previous round that they were expecting Kettering to swing more, to flank more, and to provide the opportunity for many more kills 
to be lighting up the scoreboard. Without that, because Kettering played it a lot more patient, Oklahoma State struggled to get the momentum going. They lacked real coordination because it really seemed that they couldn't figure out exactly what they wanted to do in that attack. Though the lack of coordination is gonna struggle a little bit here. Well, not coordination, but information gaining rather. They're gonna use a firebolt and some utility over on that aqua bar position despite the player have already rotated away so a little bit of misuse of utility but nothing too bad just yet for oklahoma state it's going to be all about dealing with this extension and finding their way into this round by finding a couple of early picks but now as you approach that 90 second mark kettering are proving elusive for the time being Well, Chief seems to have dropped off of the radar, as will Cosmic, as Papa finds the headshot with the 416. So that's going to remove the only hard breacher, but you still, of course, have the secondary hard breach that Hyena is now rocking. So going forth in this round, as you cross that 60-second mark, Oklahoma State are going to need to pour on the momentum here. You've got a derp trying to be a thorn in the side of this attack, and by finding that kill onto Konoma, solidifying the advantage for Kettering, things are looking rather tough here for OK State. Another kill going in favor of OK State, trying to figure out what was going wrong for them, but they have control of the bomb site. They're starting to get the bomb down. Kettering is going to have to utilize every bit of utility to stop this. A sprint challenge from Dirt was not the play they had. And now Oklahoma State has the bomb down, but they're still at a man disadvantage. Plenty of utility from all the defenders for that matter, particularly those toxic babes. But nobody expects Hyena to be ratting in a corner, sitting there relaxing, utilizing his LMG perfectly. But he's twisting in the wind, trying to actively hunt for the kills. And Papa is able to find that one. 23 seconds left on this diffuser. Slash is going to have to rotate to his window as he collects the head of Bucket, adding that to his trophy case. But where is Pop and how is he going to break this down? Instead of going for the gunfight, he's going to go for the diffuse. It's not going to work because it's a seven second diffuser timer. Slash wins the gunfight. Oklahoma State off a round that they shouldn't have won. It seems to be the theme. It seems to be the motif. They're constantly able to pull rounds out of thin air. It was all crumbling for them. I mean, you blink for one second and the bomb is down. How in the world did that happen? OK State, really? This is a team that refuses to not only be out of a map, but be out of a specific round. I mean, this team continues to amaze time and time again, as does Kettering. I mean, they are applying the pressure. They are doing everything right in the first half of it seems like most of these rounds on both maps. The traction is theirs, the foothold on the round. I mean, the round win is staring them straight in the face. But then Oklahoma State just storm in, they blind their opponents, they just, did they, I can't even, I can't even put words to it right now, Chief. Not only because I'm struggling with English tonight, but I'm struggling to really quantify the pushes that Oklahoma State are bringing to the table right now, it's incredible stuff, and they're even taking down Kettering, who, for the most part, have looked such, have looked very strong and very composed. Not only are individual players like Derp and Papa shining through, but the coordination is there in the early round, but it's all about translating your man advantage and your traction in the round into actual round wins and letting the bomb get down and not coordinating a swift retake together as a unit, well, it's going to make that brutally hard. You know what? I have a perfect way of just wrapping it up with a nice, neat bow. Guns go burr when you're gunfights. At the end of the day, that really, that's all that matters. People, you know, think, oh, this game has kind of gone in favor of a MOBA. It's, it's less about FPS. It's more about strategy. And particularly here on Coastline, you can throw strategy away. You can put it in the trash can and burn it because you can just win your gunfights exactly like Oklahoma State does. If they find themselves in a position where their strategy has failed, they synchronize, they play together as a coherent unit and roster, and they just slaughter. They win their ones. And this has actually prompted Kettering, instead of doing these big, huge roams that they love to constantly utilize, they've put the majority of their man count on the bomb itself or in a buff room nearby well this is a good change for the most part from kettering the danger of this though is 
Coastline can be attacker sided for a reason. These sites are hard to hold when it comes down to the wire. They're so open. There are so many crossfires that can be established and Bucka hoping to be the key to the roam. That sole roamer in the round getting cut down earlier than Kettering would have liked. Now Oklahoma State find themselves in the man advantage position for one of the first oh. few times. Inception. Okay there. He's got a good headshot on Tapapa swinging out on Cool Vibe stairs and things are crumbling now this time for Kettering rather than OK State. Both the German operators have now been felled and this is going to put Kettering in an awkward position. They're going to have to try to take opening duels. Derp is going to have smoke grenades, fire bolts, and shotgun shells raining all around him, but somehow he doesn't take any HP lost whatsoever. And here comes smoke grenade clipping, throwing it through the floor, throwing it through the wall, but somehow none of that toxic gas has been inhaled by any members of Oklahoma State. They're sitting very pretty right now. Sophia took a little bit of damage early on at the start of this round, but no trains have happened as of now. It's now 1v4. The ult is stuck against the world, immediately losing his life. Oklahoma staying at a 4-2 split and an attacker side of the map isn't exactly where we'd expect them to be. Well, the triple swing on Cool Vibe stairs from Kettering eh, didn't really work out in their favor, but for the most part, that was simply OK State just getting their checklist done efficiently. They took control of Blue Bar, of Cool Vibes. They applied the pressure from the Aqua side. They forced out the player behind Pink Bar. All of a sudden, Aqua control was in the hands. Billiards control was in the hands of OK State. From there, the frags lit up the scoreboard and the round will go in the Gunners' favor. And now heading to round number seven, we're on the second split now. Things are changing up. And now we're going to have to see how the strat making from Oklahoma State is going to work out on the defensive side. And if Kettering can look for the same momentum they found in map number one and go on that four round streak, if they can pull that off here, things could be concerning for Oklahoma State as well. But right now, we're sitting pretty even. This is where things would generally expect to be. So both teams are absolutely still in this fight and rearing to go forward. That's a really important Goyo shield right by this A bomb site. Now most players would expect to place it flush against the wall or the flush against the bomb itself towards the south. So touching the default plant. But the reason you put it like midway through the bomb chassis is so it doesn't get shot. The red canister behind it will not get shot from the big window or hell, which is one of the most common areas that you're gonna have an attacker setting up a crossfire. So that level of detail alone is already showing that Oklahoma State has a great understanding and a mastery of the hookah site, at least from a theory standpoint. The other Goyo shield will be placed in the long hallway facing towards 90. This is another power position where the attackers are gonna have, they're gonna take the control of the east side of the map over by where Hyena is currently playing and utilize that as another area of a crossfire. But Kettering a little bit slow on this primary execute. They're still just trying to do their homework and understanding exactly how the defenders are playing. The creativity is clearly here from OK State. They've brought out the castle. They're throwing up a lot of Goyo shields. Deployable shields in general are a plenty, but at least for Slash, that creative mind will have to find itself on camera duty for the remainder of the round. The Valkyrie not able to complete the roam down in blue bar. And that's going to allow this pressure to start building on the site. Very little off-site pressure now is left, at least on the bottom floor. It's now only the top floor pressure that is a problem to worry about for Kettering. Cosmic nearly finding the head of Derp, but not quite able to connect what could have been a round-altering kill. Hyena now rotating around down towards main lobby, looking to find the pressure in this round from another way similar to what Kettering were doing on their defense so they could be aware that there could be a security flank coming to fruition here but for the time being it's going to be on-site pressure and it's going to be inception lining up the head of Bucca taking it clean off and finding the advantage once again or neutralized at a 4v4. 
The attackers still working with the majority of their control on the first floor, but they're not prepared for Hyena in his flank. It's going to answer that with a Nitro Cell. It'll find Papa P, now dead and unable to participate in this round. How will Kettering be able to react? Are they going to pull on a strategy very similar to Oklahoma State, where they put their heads together, they pushed as a team, and are somehow able to win gunfights? A miracle gunfights at that. All three members of Kettering are on one side of the map. They're lined up trying to push through a fatal funnel it's gonna cost them dearly as more of their teammates are gonna start to fall but snappy's gonna end that as he gets one kill of his own but there's still a man one minus one man disadvantage trying to send bullets down range and hoping they connect with a member of oklahoma state who's still playing this very passively until the all gets too aggressive it should have been a passive game but it wasn't working out for them they got too aggressive it's gonna cost them their lives cosmic on the swing connects one lines up both up and oklahoma state it was a roller coaster but still nonetheless their first defensive showing is a w for them well it looked pretty clean for the most part really kettering just could not figure out a way to deal with the tomfoolery and the creative strat making that oklahoma state chose to bring to the table we saw quite an interesting setup personally one that i've never seen before i'm sure that oklahoma state have been hard at work in prepping those strats and clearly it worked out at least in round number one on their defensive half. Going forward now, they're going to elect to head to kitchen and service, but I got to focus on that previous round just one more time because I think that Kettering struggled in the same way that Oklahoma State struggled on their attack, at least in terms of flank watch, in terms of the roam clear. What we saw from Hyena there, I believe he was the Goyo in that round, he was able to rotate all the way around bottom of Aqua into offices and get a vertical angle, not only a C4 raining up from above, from below, but also a headshot just delivered through the vertical play that a C4 had enabled them. So really good use of time and good use of the entire map for Oklahoma State in that round. They figured out where Kettering was pushing from, rotated around their manpower and shut down that push for Kettering to find round number eight they are going to have to find a way to really get an understanding as soon as possible as the macro strategy that oklahoma state is bringing to the table it's something that you often don't consider when you're spectating a siege match we have top down view we've got wall hacks we know where the utility is being deployed but from an attacking perspective when all you're looking through is you know the little camera of a drone it's gonna be oh. so hard I can't believe what we just saw there. That's a, that is a drone hole kill. Hyena gonna make me finish off that point, but I will point out that it's hard to figure out where utility is being applied, where the attackers, or where the defenders rather, are using that utility appropriately. And so countering it can be so challenging when you're encountering a strat that you've never seen before. And well, we have seen it before, but it is so rare to see a kill in the drone hole coming out from Hyena. The most important operator in the kitchen execute for the attackers has lost their life. The sledgehammer will be no more. Bucca is the only one that has any soft destruction whatsoever. He's already used one of his charges on the top patch, which means he can only open up two holes with his floor mounted charges. And sure, he can use his impact grenades as well, but that means he won't be able to utilize it on the cameras of Hyena or the shield of smoke. It's a dangerous position to be, but Cosmic gets too aggressive. He overpeaks and it costs him his life. Now there's a triple reinforcement in Master Bedroom. This can work out both ways, as Mute won't be able to rotate away, but he's still able to find one off the missed drone of Kettering. Things are looking even worse for them, but again, it's all off a mastery of strategy. Slash gonna make it a mastery of gun skill, finding the headshot and removing another Kettering attacker from the playing field. Pucka gonna sneak around through Hall of Fame and actually circumvent for the most part this pressure on the master's side, but now caught out, this could be quite dangerous because there's no support from the team and now caught in a impossible crossfire to get out of. Despite that, cutting down Slash, who's busy reloading and walking around like a goober, is gonna get cut down, but Inception will quickly Get the follow-up onto Anomaly. Buck is all that remains. It's got to go for the retake of the Diffuser. Has to go for some sort of miracle play here. Swinging out with the a lifeline in hand rather than the gun. It's going to pay him at least a bit of damage, but Buck will uh, end up finding the kill onto Inception. Hyena looking to make the vertical play happen, but for now, it's going to be a waiting game for the Anchors 
and a game of vertical play for the Zofia. More explosions, but somehow nobody was alerted to that on Oklahoma State. So Buck is going to get himself a free kill. Now down into a 1v1 with 15 seconds left on the clock. Baka has the diffuser at hand. He's going to have to go for the drop. It's going to be a north window execute for him. Hopefully Hyena is prepared for that. With four seconds left, he has really no option other than putting the bomb on the deck. It's a passive strategy and Oklahoma State wins purely based off time. Another great round couple with a great strategy time is a great way of showing you that the strategy was really just too much it wasn't necessarily the gun skill at the end of the day for Oklahoma State that brought them through to now match point it was passive play coupled with good application of utility good strat making and something that Kettering struggled to identify struggled to deal with and the time got the best of them as it can so often do so going forth now to match point Kettering with their playoff hopes on the line they have to win four rounds in a row reminding everybody that of course both of these teams have earned their spot to play in a relegation match for those premier invite spots but I gotta say it's looking good for Oklahoma State to move forward to the championship match where they will have their shot at that $650 open league prize pool, where the winner will walk away with the grand open prize of $450, and the loser will get $200. But four rounds still are able for Kettering to take, and if they do so, they will be in this fight. I wish there was something we could say, Chief, that was like, Kettering have proved they could do this on coastline. You've got to expect they can bring this back, but I'm struggling to figure out exactly what that hope would be. Dealing with the offsite pressure in a controlled manner. Understanding, you know, there's going to be somebody upstairs over Master Bedroom's side. All right, we need to take Master Bedroom. Those two bits of information come together. Say, hey, roam clearing is going to be our primary objective. We have to send our drones down range, and we lock somebody in Master Bedroom. Wait, he's actually locked himself in Master Bedroom. He has no hope of rotating. He has no friends, and he has no help. It's a free execute for the attackers. They should deal with that. But as soon as Papa P was felled, the round was mentally lost for Kettering, and I think that's the most important thing. And Derp, just a slow crouch walk in through the hookah door wasn't the play. It's going to cost him his life, and Kettering is starting to look like a defeated roster the mistakes they're making is not the roster that we saw on villa they're gonna have to do a quick mental check and with two minutes into this round or two minutes left in this round which is starting to look like the final round that wow, mental okay, shift has to happen asap well the shift their focus has shift to get in as soon as possible and get this vertical play going but they're they're really stalling out on that approach, and Oklahoma State are doing a good job at shutting down any entrance that Kettering are attempting to make into just the building as a whole. Snappy has decided to just be holding an angle, which could work if the defenders are going to keep swinging, but Oklahoma State, well, actually he will. Kanoma's just going to walk right up on into Hooka and look for the shots and rotate away in the nick of time. A dangerous maneuver, but one that was not punished by Kettering so far. Pop is just going to go for the run-in and cut down Cosmic, but the play is there from Kanoma. They're playing brilliantly off of each other. Oklahoma State will secure the trade and maintain the main advantage now into the closing minutes. The best player on Kettering has now been lost. Papa P has been so instrumental. Forced to take the back seat and forced to be watching those flank drones for the remainder of the round. We're going to have to see what his teammates are capable of bringing. Now Bucca has so close to achieving the exact same scoreline of Papa P and he is alive and active. He's going to dance around a nitro cell. It will remove some of his HP, but it was a lucky miss to say the least. Actually, not sure what explosive that was. It might have been an impact grenade from Hyena because the Nitro Cell is still in the back pocket of Slash. So, impact grenades don't do quite as much damage as their explosive counterpart in the Nitro Cell department. And here comes Kettering.
starting to go for their final execute. The ceiling above the Jaeger is going to start to remove. Snappy's going to find one. He's going to make it out too. It's a two-man advantage with little time left on the clock. And it's going to be the doomsday hour for Kettering. Are they going to save this round? Are they going to be able to come back? Hyena spots the vault in from the window. Bucka gets the kill. The diffuser's going down. There's no cover whatsoever. And Hyena able to go for the swing. Saves his team and delivers themselves to the grand finals. Oh, the the time. Once again, it got the better of Kettering and Oklahoma State. It does turn out that the coastline back pocket map was exactly what they needed or what assisted them in their win here tonight. It wasn't the cleanest 2-0 of all time, but it was a 2-0 regardless. Oklahoma State turns out they're the team that, well, was foretold to go all the way to the grand finals. They have earned their ticket, and now they have their shot at fighting for that $650 prize pool. A fantastic map, Chief. And is there anything else you want to point out about this one before we uh, possibly get into our interview here? Just win your ones. At the end of the day, sometimes <laughs> strategy doesn't matter. You need to win your gunfights, and... Oklahoma State won that through the entire series. Constantly, we would see Kettering on Villa would have a better understanding of the map. They would have a better strategy, and they would just lose the round purely based off the mechanical skill of Oklahoma State. They are a force to be reckoned with, and moving on to the grand finals, you're going to have to find a way to cool off those hands, cool off those guns, because the moment they heat up, they are just a volcano. Yeah, and Coastline, it feeds itself into that yeah. win your ones meta. I mean, that, that just happens every single time. And something that we saw from Oklahoma State there was not only playing into that very meta, but was also using the strats as well. Not often do we say that a strat on Coastline actually wins you the map, but from Oklahoma State, whether it was brilliant strat making of their own or simply something Kettering just could not deal with, I mean, you got to give props to Oklahoma State for deciding that Coastline is the map they wanted to fight it out on. And, well, they made it happen. They did do some fighting there. And now, Jay-Z, I heard a rumor that there might be an interview, but not just your regular <laughs> run-to-the-mill interview. There might be a, a double. double. No. Oh, it's not a double interview? That's well, I'm heartbroken. <laughs> but nonetheless, Mr. Slash has returned here. Welcome, my friend. Uh, thank you, Chief and Jay-Z. What a series. Let's talk about map number two. We saw some unique strategies. What was the idea of saving that map coastline and bringing out here in the semifinals? Um, yeah, we've never played this map this season at all. I don't think I've ever intentionally picked this map when I, while I've played Collegiate R6. I'm not going to lie. But we scrimmed it probably like four times, played against our B team a ton, and we just practiced it a lot. Because no, uh, we saw that Kettering had never played coastline. And we just figured that we need to do something different because obviously Kettering is an amazing team. As you saw on Villa, they, they had our number there. So yeah, Coastline was just uh, the map we figured would be our best option for winning. Now, if I can pick something micro to talk about, when you guys went to your kitchen defense, you ended up reinforcing all of Master Bedroom and burying your player there. What was the idea behind that strategy? So what we do there is we just have... The guy up there, he's playing for his life, playing for time, yeah. and just playing for, to get the kill up there. Um, I, I, it's pretty risky because sometimes he gets slammed, sometimes he doesn't. But yeah, we just figured that that guy up there puts pressure on the attackers trying to take vertical control, and usually he's able to get some kills. So Now moving on to map number one, which was Villa. You guys were actually down by two rounds. Your opponents were on match point. And all of a sudden, you guys were able to find those two attacker victories. What happened between round 10 and round 11? Um, so we were just chilling in Discord, and I was giving the boys a pep talk. We had about a good 10 minutes. We just regrouped and said, like, hey, what we're doing is not working. They have our number. They're roamers. We cannot kill them. So coming out of the break, we just decided to just, just push Master all the way to Aviator, push Sight, take control there. And first of all, props to my teammate Cosmic for winning 1v1s. That boy doesn't lose 1v1s. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Now, before I pass it over to Jay-Z, talking about 1v1s, you guys were at man disadvantages constantly. 4v2s and somehow able to win it. 
across both maps. Are you guys just hyping yourselves up? Are you guys putting yourself in better positions? What leads you to being able to win these miraculous rounds? Yeah, so I think a lot of the time, like, we don't panic or anything. We don't worry about that. Um, like, 2v5, 2v4, or whatever. Even, like, 1v4s, as you saw with Kanoma on uh, mm -hmm. Villa. Um, I wouldn't say, like, we don't practice or anything. I think it's just part of how our team plays and how composed we are. And with clear comms and calm comms, um, winning those deficit rounds is just an easier thing for our team. And we've just done it so much to where we're not even worried when we're down man advantage. Perfect. Jay-Z, any follow-up questions before you let him celebrate? Yeah, well, you hit you hit really all the big ones. Slash, <laughs> I mean, as always, it's good to see you in the booth. We've, uh, yes, sir. I, I, I mean, I can't even keep count of how many times we've done an interview together at this point. I guess one question I want to ask, or two things really. The, the, the first one is, you know, there was a lot of antics going into this match. You said, uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, throwing Fua in there as a little bit of a bait. We even saw that on stream. We saw the the switch middle of the of the lobby you know obviously you ended up prevailing over Kettering how how much did did that factor in or was that simply something additional you wanted to throw into the mix so it was just something additional but I do think like the, the entire week leading up to this was brain games um us and Kettering are very close in my discord we're always talking to the guys me and Buck are in the DMs talking every day so a lot leading up to this game was brain games as you saw with like our coastline pick we were baiting, saying that Fu was going to play instead of Hyena. So, I mean, we, we were just having some fun trying to mess with Kettering. But uh, the fact that we're so close, and I know they watch VODs on us. Like, they they counter shredded us hard on Villa, because I know that's what Buck is about. So, yeah. All right, well, the final one, I guess. There were quite a few doubters out there in the community, given your performance. Not yours specifically, but Oklahoma State as a whole. Your performance in the last few weeks saying that Kettering is better than you, placing Kettering above you in the overall collegiate power rankings. Is there anything that you want to use this opportunity to say to those people? Yeah, to be honest, I really don't care about the power rankings. I mean, I appreciate the guys that do it. Nothing against them, but uh, we, we don't care about power rankings. We're here to win the Open again. Uh, I did not care that Kettering was above us. They deserve it. They were the number one seed in Open. That's not a factor at all. Um, but going forward, I mean... We, we were told that we were going to get slammed by SFU by everyone on that dirt report. We beat them 14-5, so I'll just leave it at that, but yeah. All right, well, Slash, your last opportunity, you can shout out your teammates, shout out your supporters, your organization, anyone who you'd like. The mic is, of course, yours. I will just shout out all my teammates for playing great with me tonight and helping me when I wasn't doing great. Um, shout out to you casters, obviously, Jay-Z, Chief, you guys are great, and Tango. Um, and everyone watching, I see there's a bunch of people in my Discord watching, so thanks for the support, and yeah. All right, Slash, a pleasure as always. Celebrate with your team, of course, and we look forward to uh, casting your grand finals, which will be yes, in a sir. couple of weeks, and we'll see you uh, take on either Boston or UC San Diego. An interesting match. Good luck. Thank you. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's only going to do it for map number one and series number one for the night. We've got semifinal number two. It is Boston versus UC San Diego on the other side of the bracket. The winner, of course, will face Oklahoma State in the championship match. We are going to take a few minutes until we get to that one. Chief and I, we're going to refresh our speaking ability, maybe learn some English along the way if we can. But until then, grab some refreshments, get some relaxing music going to prep you for the spiciness that we're going to see in the second series. Until then, we will be right back.
Ladies and gentlemen, CR6 is back on the other side of the bracket here in the semifinals. It's Boston versus UC San Diego. One of these teams will be moving on to the grand finals. My partner in crime is Jay-Z and running production today. That is a Mango Salsa himself. Thank you, Mango, down in the booth. As always, it's good to have him here. And it's good to be with you, Chief. It's always a pleasure to cast with you, especially on a map on a, a, a series like this one. We've got Boston, we've got UC San Diego. Both of these teams have come a long way since the regular season. Neither of these two teams were actually favored to get this far. They have both defied expectations and have put on a show while doing it. The big story is Boston, who has found a way to take down the favorites to go against Oklahoma State, the University of Texas at Dallas, UTD. Boston figured out a way to not only take them down, would book their ticket to the semifinals while doing it. And so going forward into this series, Boston, the two seed, San Diego, the 14th seed. So Whoa. you know who the favorites are, but you're not going to have to, I think all bets are going to be off on this one because, you know, on this side of the bracket, we've seen a lot of upsets. We've seen a lot of crazy things. And as we take a look at our map bands and actually see where we're going to end up, it's not going to be anything too crazy. We've got the T3 special club, Oregon and Villa chief. I can sense. You're not super happy about that. <laughs> yeah, the T3 special, man. <sighs> You're going to be okay. I'll survive. I'll survive. <laughs> yeah, Clubhouse has been a legacy map. It is one of those maps that have been around since day one. It was the first map to actually get reworked before they even called them reworks. They called them a map buff. It got a little bit of changes, and ever since then, it has been a staple in the competitive pool. Oregon, on the other hand, it was at one point. However, it had a crazier rework than as counterpart of clubhouse and actually as a result people love the new iteration of oregon so much it's become one of the primary or secondary maps and the problem with that is just about every t3 team under the sun is capable of playing at all three maps we plan to play today well you mentioned the negatives of the special, but what I, what you do love about seeing these staple maps is you're not really going to have any shenanigans. You're not going to see any maps like Theme Park or Coastline that can shake up the way these two teams are going to go at each other. I mean, we've got three staple maps that these teams wouldn't be here if they didn't know how to play these three maps. A map like Theme Park, you could get this far without playing Theme Park at all. It can be your Insta-ban every single time. Same for Consulate. I mean, those maps that aren't as favored by teams just don't have their time in the light like these three. But because of that, it is a perfect comparison between these two teams. You know for a fact that the better team is going to win here tonight. Rather than if you throw some weird maps in the mix, maybe that's not quite the case. But you've got Clubhouse first, a strat-heavy map that both of these teams are going to come out strong on. Oregon next. Equally strat heavy, but you can throw some fun frag fest nature into that as well. I'm going to love to, you know, wait and see exactly what these two teams bring in terms of their overall strategies, because I know it is going to be something worth watching. Oh, hey, look who's been banned for Thatcher. What a surprise. 
Everybody seems to want to remove him, and his partner in crime as well. Maverick has now been shut down, and this is going to force Kaid. He has to be banned. One of the strongest electric units on this map, simply because you can put his charges in positions that will not be destroyed. Yeah, you've got the Valkyrie off the board as well. So the Information Queen will not be a factor in this first map, nor will Maestro. So the information on defense is going to be challenging. I'm wondering if we're going to see an Echo or maybe, maybe more bulletproof cameras in play simply because the information game is going to be seriously lacking without the black eyes or those evil eyes that both of those information favorite operators bring to the table. So something that these defensive teams are definitely going to have to work around. Cade being let through seems like a mistake. And I can't remember the last time I've seen this combination of bands with Kaid actually allowed through. He is going to be a menace to say the least. Good luck ever opening up a top patch. Good luck ever opening up a wall. A competent team is going to put them in positions that will never be destroyed. You can bring out a Kali, sure. However, if you're attacking on CCTV, you throw one of those K claws in the actual TV unit. You throw one on the other side of the wall, so the explosive damage of a Kali Lance won't be able to accomplish your goal. The same thing can be said here as we go downstairs in the basement. You put a Kai Claw on the other side of the top hatch and you bury it away from any explosive that the Lance will achieve. Now, the other K Claw can be grabbed if you put it over a dirt tunnel and or on the top hatch over by B. But a competent team is going to go for impact grenades. And I say that San Diego has elected to not bring impact grenades. And we're not going to see the impact tricking on that kitchen hatch that can be so powerful, even, of course, with the Habana buff and the fact that only two of those pellets need to be put out at any single given time. It's still a very efficient use of time, at least waste of time for a defensive team. They can simply just sit there raining impacts from below and preventing the kitchen hatch for at least being opened early on. And as we can see here, it's all going to be about the top down clear that Boston are going to be trying to implement. They're going to send their operators in from above, just work their way, clearing out any roamers, making sure they figure out exactly who they have to deal with and get that clear going. That's going to be Room Room, the first player at least, for them to encounter the cap can on that main stairs push. But as the Jerome army, you can see it here, is just pouring on down the stairs. They have realized there is no top floor extension, and now the pressure onto that, that first floor and the basement site will begin. I love the drone use from Boston. It's great. They've done their homework. They understand how the rumors are going to be moving throughout this map. But now that they have control, how are they going to now deal with opening up these hot packs? Room Room is going to be the primary point of engagement. He is going to be denying those north stairs for as long as possible. And Cryptic is trying to play it passively. He's almost having a sixth sense moment where he can tell if there's some member that might be going for the swing. However, that is not quite the case. And everybody other than the Jaeger is currently in the actual bomb site. Yeah, the lack of that exact bomb site hold could be problematic for UC San Diego going forward here, but with Boston taking their sweet time to get this pressure going, simply opting for that information game is going to be something that UCSD are going to have to take into account soon. We see them positioning for a potential kitchen execute. They've got their operators in position. The one danger, of course, you don't have a lot of smokes to work with. We're not going to see a Cappy Tau in play. It's going to have to be a more methodical clear with some brilliantly placed smoke grenades from Widget, the ace who wields those canisters. You've got Sharp on that Cali, holding an extremely long angle down from the bottom of main stairs, so nobody is going to be willing to swing that or cross on over to the armory site if a plant is going to go down there. But the time is dwindling away. The 22nd meta may indeed come into fruition here as the moto push is increasing, and now it does appear that the attackers are starting to pivot exactly where they want to approach from. They've got a player in dirt now, and now the push into church is all but coming through. You've got one lining up for UCSD, but then the kills are going to roll on back and forth for both of these teams. The scoreboard lighting up both teams, and now it's going to be a 2v2 in the closing moments. 
going to be a full sin. They're going to have to reclaim that diffuser that has been locked away. Their gunfights from Alpaca is going to be perfect in that, but they still have to shut down this SMG-11. Diffuser now confirmed. Ashwall getting opened up, and the SMG-11 starting to sing. A ton of damage has been dealt to Alpaca, sitting on a sliver of HP. Now felled as we go into a post plant. Cryptics on just as low as HP. One bullet will be his undoing. Connected quickly. And Puggy able to save the round for his team. It was a roller coaster to be said at least. But fortunately for San Diego, they start off the round in good fashion. Well, a good retake there from Pudgy Wudgy. Making it happen on the smoke. Doing, I guess, what smoke does best. Just retake the site. SMG11 goes burr and you take down any attackers willing to challenge you. Even if it was a Kali with a massive sniper, not having her gun up was her demise. So a uh, back and forth round characterized by a main stairs and moto send from Boston. But UC San Diego did a good job to counter it. They maintained their cool on the site and a retake from Pudgy Wudgy will give them round number one. So a good job there. Boston struggled early to figure out exactly where they wanted to get their execute going. I love, I like that we saw how they changed on the fly. They really shifted where their attack was initially approaching from. But for the most part, it was UCSD who ended up pulling it out at the end of the day. Boston unable to really make the proper use of the time, utility, and all their resources, uh, at least to get their success going. And here comes Invulnerable Kaikaz Part 2. The problem with UCSD's defense is they didn't quite abuse it as well as I would have liked them to. But nonetheless, they're going to have to... Oh no, they did not. Please, he didn't put it in the right position. It's no longer an Invulnerable Kaika. It's just a traditional place. But he's now rectified his mistake. He put it in the right position. It was almost a little sketchy there. We're going to have to see how Boston is going to react to this. The really only way of dealing with this is a poor place call in that TV rack. You open up the west window C or CCTV and you send your bullets down range. You couple that with an IQ and it could work in your favor. However, Boston has doubled down on the Cali. Again, high risk, high reward type strategy. We're going to have to be really conscious of the opportunity cost of your utility. Yeah, we're going to have to see if these Kali's lances can actually take what? care of those Electro Claws. The Selma is going to go down preemptively, and it actually might have gotten destroyed by the Lance. I'm not entirely sure how that went down, but now you can confirm that one of the Selmas has now been wasted, and the Electro Claws remain a factor of the wall. Nearly impossible to actually get on open because of that Thatcher ban, because of that Maverick ban, it's always tougher to get the, the, the wall actually open. And if you're going to make the critical mistake of leaving the Kaid on the board and allow those Electro Claws, those invulnerable Electro Claws to be in play, you can say goodbye to your hopes at opening up the platform wall. It's going to have to be a take from elsewhere. We can see Cryptic, Alpaca, and Sharp all working their way in from the construction side, opting to pressure cash from elsewhere. But in the meantime, you've got two attackers challenging on Garage. That's Chow, or Cho, dealing with this pressure from here. The Malusi in bottom garage is hoping to seal this one out, but the pressure from everywhere is the story for UC San Diego. You've got Meow, the Jaeger, challenging from the other side, but will soon rotate away as his position has been spotted out, and he will rotate back away. So far, UCSD is doing a wonderful job holding this map. The attacker is going to have to do a full rotation. They have control of connector. That is part of the rotation accomplished, but as a linear execute, you need to set up a crossfire of some sort, and sending me through the CCTV window will not be your play. You're going to need to take control of Garage or send it up the red stairs at least. Every second that clock winds down, that's going to put Boston in a very awkward position. Their aggression level is going to have to start to increase. And they're going to have to start to swing for gunfights. If you allow UCSD just to waste time and sit back and relax, it's going to play perfectly into this strategy. Sharp is going to find the opening kill. And Witch is going to start to put the bomb down. Answered back by Nitro Cell. Sharp is going to find another one for himself. And it's going to be a re-attempt of that bomb plant once again. But with no battle from the Nitro Cell. Cryptic is almost down. Room room for the swing. He runs out of ammo. Forced to go to the pistol. And now it's a 2v2 post plant. Sharp again the world he's got to go for the clutch ace 
Well, a tough situation here for Room Room. He's going to be looking around, trying to figure out exactly where these post-plant attackers are positioned, but it's going to be tough. He's going to have to get aggressive or find some pre-fires here sitting around. He's not going to be able to find the kills. He'll finally take down Sharp. That's the quad, but he needs to find one more. That's Baka, the Ash. He's holding passive prone outside of construction. Room Room needs to tease this diffuser or get aggressive, and he's going to choose the latter, and he's going to find the grave as a result. Baka playing it smart on low HP, and despite the platform wall remaining hard, despite a cash attack that should have been shut down, Boston finds themselves an attacking win. That was a round that Boston had no right of winning. They won it based on just walking into the bomb site and the defenders just not prepare for that. When you have an equal man count, the attacker is pushing through one door frame. You as a defender are going to sit back and just watch the chaos happen. Because you know the attackers only play. The attackers' cards have been dealt in front of you. You can read them perfectly. And you as a defender can communicate amongst yourselves. Say, I'm holding this angle. You're holding this angle. There is no possible way of entering. Oh, we also have the contingency plan. If they go for a flank up the garage stairs or up the red stairs, we're also prepared for that. However, UCSD never made that communication. And as soon as the planter started to put the bomb down, the crash from UCSD wasn't there. They need to synergize and communicate a little bit more on the defense. I'll, I'll, I'll do you one better, Chief. I, I think Ooh, that spicy. once you realize, once you realize that that wall is not going to be open, once the first Selma charge got destroyed and the Cali Lance could not take care of the Electro Claws, you have to realize that you don't have to be staring at the wall anymore. You can rotate utility. You can move a deployable shield. And instead of having a top red facing the CCTV run in from a non existent breach, maybe add that shield to a cash hole. We see teams that can be mobile with their utility. And that is, those teams really can just shine through whether they win a round or not. You love to see the, the brains working. You love to see big brain siege. And that's not something we saw from UCSD in that round prior. They did not bother to rotate their utility despite knowing full well the only avenue that Boston had was a full cash send. They were vulnerable to it the entire time. Boston did a fantastic job at capitalizing on the mistakes that San Diego made. So going forth for round number three, it's going to be the exact same bomb site in play once again, given the unsuccessful nature of round number two. And once again, these attackers, they're going to have to approach from this construction side. Maybe it's going to be a Raptors take as well, but a Raptors take isn't going to bear you much fruit if the CCTV wall remains hard. The problem also the Raptors take is you have no explosives to kill the players sitting in R1. That will be the Kain. If you had a frag grenade, you whip that bad boy up there. It connects with its target, and that's a free kill. An awkward set of engagements already starting to transpire. Mute, util or not mute, Smoke sending one of his toxic babes down range. That was bad use of utility. There was nobody on the receiving end. He should have waited for his utility to be utilized when the attackers actually go for the push. Widget lines his headshot up, unable to control the AK-12 recoil, gets flicked on and slammed. A huge oversight. AG goes to the rotate, deals with Baka. This round is looking better for UCSD simply because Boston is swinging every gunfight and losing it. It's the 1v1 meta for Boston, taking one gunfight at a time, one player at a time without support from their teammates. And no surprise there, they have found three players in the grave as a result. Very little utility has been expended. UCSD can simply wait for Boston to walk into their open arms. Alpaca sees what could be the bean of the Malusi, but the Malusi is going to swing out and Cryonax will net the kill onto Alpaca. Cryptic is all that remains staring against five hungry defenders. And with only 20 seconds to do it, he's going to prep a window for a quick escape. The UC San Diego, the Nitro Cells raining on out. The Swing is raining on out. And Cryptic will find one kill to pad the KD just a little bit. He sees the shotgun barrel of the smoke. That's Pudgy Wudgy. And he's actually going to drop down Cryonix as well. But Pudgy Wudgy on the Swing. The M590 does its close range job well. And UC San Diego will recover 
from the previous round's mistakes, and they will take round three. Pudgy Wudgy was a bear. Pudgy Wudgy had no hair. He swung you with the shotgun and you died. Nice. Unfortunate position to be in when you're the attackers in a 1v4, but a valiant attempt nonetheless. And like you were saying, the problem with that 1v4 is it was a 1v4. You need to put yourself in a position where the attackers are winning optimal gunfights. And I hate to criticize individuals for just losing ones off bad crosshair placement or a bad swing, but the rounds started to slip away from Boston as soon as Widget was unable to connect his shots. Things happen in the server. Sometimes you just get a little bit too excited, but nonetheless, that one mistake by Boston ended everything. Because if Kain was able to be felled, that will allow the attackers an avenue into garage. You've now set up your crossfire and you can do more or less the same exact execute you did in round two. Going for that exact style of plan, taking control of construction, it will work because you can force the attackers and force those defenders to swing on two different crossfires at the same time. And the likelihood of you winning that is just low. But nonetheless, UC San Diego is now back to their primary bomb site downstairs in the basement. And remember, the last time they're here, it was a clutch victory for the smoke himself, Mr. Pudgy Wudgy. So we're gonna have to see if he's able to bring that level of brilliance or if his teammates are gonna be able to hold the roam a little better. Last time we saw how Boston went for that top-down clear and they did it very efficiently given that they actually had no resistance until they hit main stairs. So they were able to clear from the CC side all the way over to Jim without much of interference whatsoever. And it appears that the story of round number four will be the full anchor on site as well. An interesting strategy, but one we do see often the turtle play is viable to say the least, but there's nothing wrong with throwing a roamer on the top of main stairs and shooting a couple of drones as they work their way towards site. There's literally zero reason not to do that. It's free, a couple of drones, and you back off and you play passively, and there you go. You're not going to die. You're not going to spend much time off the clock, but you've at least taken up some utility because if you look at right now, it's a minute into the round, and normally where Boston's drone utility could probably be lacking, they've got all 10 drones to assist all five operators comfortable and happily still on the board and ready to make this push going. But last time we were here, Boston struggled to actually figure out where they wanted to pressure on this site and how to do so efficiently. Correcting those mistakes is going to be key to their round number four success. I don't think I've ever seen 10 drones alive with 90 seconds in the round. That's the first one on me. The attacker is doing a wonderful job of cracking up in every single patch. Again, those Kaede Claws need to be placed in positions where they won't be destroyed. And since you have an ace in play, going for a quick beat top hatch drop is very doable. You go for the smoke plays, you deny the entry, you deny the angles. However, again, Boston is not running any frag grenades. So removing power positions is going to be a lot more difficult. Ash wall being opened up by the attackers will help with that. Not only will that give them an avenue to set up crossfires, but they can also deny entry into multiple avenues of the bomb site for the defender to try to work their way through. Well, Pudgy Wudgy holding this angle here in Moto, it's actually not going to matter for the time being as AG Meow is going to line up one in Room Room. will secure the double. The Jaeger goes for the play and he's going to get it. The double kill. Room Room off screen will get another and the flawless round will come through for UC San Diego. What an upside down round. You have so much utility, Boston. You can't be dying with it in your pocket. We were saying, wow, they have 10 drones. That's phenomenal. But the opportunity cost of you dying with your drone in your pocket, not on flank watch, is just too high. Utilize them to your advantage. They're probably the most important asset of the attackers. They are the most important asset the attackers have. I'll, I'll confirm that. I'll double down on that. If you aren't confirming where the defenders are with 60 seconds left on the clock, you're just going to be dry peeking, face challenging angles. And you're going to lose those gunfights. Sure, you might have great reaction time. You might be able to win fights. But why not utilize that drone economy as an asset? And this is going to be a perfect test of that. We're going to go over to the tertiary bomb site, A bomb site that we're going to see not only a true large map roam, but we're going to see an extension into the east 
side of the map over by Cashbox and CCTV. Those drones are going to be imperative to help the attackers understand how many defenders are over in Cashbox, the utility they brought, and how quickly they can respond to a fast attack. Well, something I think that Boston are slowly learning is that it would be nice to just ban the Kaid when you don't have a Thatcher or a Maverick. We saw they struggled to really get those hatches open despite having the Kali, the main stairs, full send. Didn't work out so well in the end. It's going to have to be a tertiary bombsite attack, though, and generally considered the easiest bombsite to attack. It's a tertiary bombsite for a reason because it is harder to hold. It's going to be all about this cash extension for the defense. This is something that pretty much every team will do on this bomb site. It is the defensive way of hoping to maintain their control of the site for as long as possible. Because once you give up construction control, the combination of logistics and the windows and construction make it very hard to actually hold down either gym or bedroom for that matter so it's all going to be about the efficiency with which boston can take control of cash and baka using those breaching rounds from below is going to look to expedite that process the mirror window now popped now cryonax is going to have an even tougher time holding this position opting for aggression rather than a retreat will not quite work out in the kaid's favor 30 HP is now all that he is left with. The pressure from below continuing to build. He's got to get out of there alive, nearly getting taken down, but one HP, all that he has left, and Alpaca will have something to say about that. Baca will rain out another kill on an AG Meow, who goes for the lounge flank, and things will now be in a tremendous advantage position for Boston going into their execute. What a turn of events. Cryro left the bomb site or left his extension. He tried to retreat from construction. He thought better about the decision, tried to go back into cash, thought better about that again, and tried to sprint away then dying. He needed to commit to at least one of those strategies as the decision has cost him his life and has put his team quite on the back foot. That's a minus two man disadvantage. But there is not that much time left in this round, so that is going to be somewhat of an asset for San Diego. But with Alpaca finding that kill, that asset is going to start to fall away. Pudgy Wudgy with SMG 11 hand connects to one, but he's going to have to go for the clutch ace. His position is known. It's going to be almost impossible. Bullets are going to come from every possible direction. It's going to be the Snap Cali sniper rifle blow sharp from behind. Boston rectifying those mistakes and finding themselves another round win here on the clubhouse attack. Something we love to talk about, Chief, is that you win the clubhouse on the attack. It is, it is generally a defensive-sided map, and if you can take that 3-3 three to three split or even a 4-2 to two split on your attacking half, now not, not only is that job well done, but it is congratulations, you're looking good for your defensive half as well. So something that Boston are going to be looking to do is find this last elusive third attacking round on Clubhouse, but UCSD will be looking to respond in their own way as well. The unsuccessful gym defense was really a result of a swift Boston attack that overwhelmed not only the cash extension, but any off-site pressure that UC San Diego chose to bring to the forefront. It seemed that they did not have a contingency plan for a player coming from below to deal with the cash extension. The ash from below was simply too much for Cryonax to deal with. He had to fall off the angle, but he did so far too late. Once the wall was opened up by Boston, they found the long angle they needed into construction to find a couple of kills and really make it really tough for San Diego to get the comeback going. So overall, a good job from Boston in round number five, but they're going to have to figure out a way to attack this bomb site without getting the platform wall open, something that they have been unable to do for the most part so far. And the thing is, you don't always have to open the eastmost wall. You can get around it. We've seen professional players, and I actually believe it was Europe that was running construction takes for a while. It, it wasn't in this meta. It was in the previous meta. Because So it does work. We know that it works. You just have to be able to take control of garage, and you have to take control of construction. If you want to bring a cap attack, that's a great way of removing players sitting over in the rafters. You send those firebolts sky high, you burn them, and then now you have your control. You bring a set of fragments, the same style of play. You just have to flash the ADSs. 
Or you could also have the defenders just dry peek into a sniper rifle. That is also an option. It's probably the least viable of those options. You need to be playing passive on rafters. You have to be forcing the attackers to make a play, overextend their hands, and then you as a defender capitalize on it. And so far, the defense is just playing a little bit too aggressive. And they're really not prepared for the players sitting over in stocks. But nonetheless, Witch is going to lose a little bit of his HP. Yeah, the aggression here from UCSD is something to definitely give them the upper hand if it were to work out well, but if Austin can figure out a way to counter that, doing so by just sitting down and just holding a bunch of angles, then, well, things may end up going in their favor instead. Despite the invulnerable Kaids being utilized, the wall will indeed be opened up, and Widget will now establish this long angle into CCTV. That's only one step of the process. Now you have to decide where the rest of your attack is going to come from. The best course of action is typically Rafter's control. Other than that, Chow is going to be able to hold this down. Even with one HP, he can still hold this down for the remainder of the round. You should force out this player, which is easy to do just because he only has one HP. And from there, you get your crossfire that you were talking about, Chief. You get your default line of sight established to get that diffuser down. But right now, this attack from Boston is a little bit split up. They're attacking from the other side as well. This construction push is coming through. And Baka finding one kill from below, removing the over-aggressive AG Meow, pushing up secret that's a good start for boston pudgy wudgy i believe has utilized all of his toxic babes he needs to be saving it for when the actual execute of boston comes out baka wins another one of his gun fights and this is going to put ucsd in a very awkward position they themselves are going to have to answer it back with aggression pudgy wudgy won't even know where he's being shot cut from loses his life but so will cali UCSD is still in a very bad position. That's going to force Alpaca to start to put the bomb down. A Nitro Cell, if it connects, it's going to be huge. Shot in the air. And now it's on Room Room Vector in hand. He will also not know where he gets shot from. It seems like UCSD just wants to sprint their way into their own deaths. Well, you said it beautifully earlier, Chief. The shift key can often be the end of many defenders' life. Attackers' lives as well here in Collegiate R6. Maybe pop that key out and things would be a little bit better off. But, I mean, if you look at the situation, it was, of course, a 1v4, a brutal one. And the sprint play was a latch -dish ditch effort to maintain any control that the defense could have on the round. But we talked about how important that third round would be for Boston. And they have now managed to secure it, despite being down a disadvantage early on. And so going forward to their defensive half... Of course, we can't read too much into this. We're really going to have to uh, see what goes on in round number one. But you have to consider that Boston could very well be in the upper hand position right now. They have their three rounds. They could go ahead and get that defensive sided clubhouse that we often see. So seeing their setup here, a very similar operator lineup being brought out on this CCTV cache bomb site. We've got Alpaca bringing out those Electro Claws once again. And on the side of UC San Diego, not electing to bring the Cali to deal with it. Therefore, you might consider that they'd be approaching from that construction side or the rafters take instead. I'm already concerned about how UCSD is going to execute. And I'm definitely reading into something very small. Five drones from UCSD just drove in through the east door of Garage. If you're an IGL, it's your job to coordinate where the drones go, whether or not they're going back to the pocket of somebody, or if they are going throughout the map for flank watch, or also for an insertion point into the attacking team. But if you don't have a coordinated drone strategy already, that's going to greatly hurt your attacking lineup, because that shows that you don't have a strong attacking mentality you don't have a strong macro strategy when taking control of the map and you can see this right now ucsd spawn to the east they're instead doing a west execute if they wanted to have better time management they would have spawned to the west side of the map over by shipping they would have saved them about 10 seconds and 10 seconds doesn't sound like a big deal but it will start to compound with more mistakes throughout a round that 10 seconds will turn into 30 seconds way too quickly well, the top down clear with 60 seconds burned off the clock, or at least this west side clear, rather, has now generally been completed. 
This is your typical cash side take. You're building all of that pressure from this construction side. But the way we can see Boston positioning right now, they seem to know what they're dealing with. They haven't repositioned any utility just yet. The top red shield could very well be positioned on that other side. But Chief, what we are seeing right here is it could be a critical oversight for Boston. They have not utilized a reinforcement on the top of red stairs. A crucial reinforcement to hold that position on the top of red to stop the, the push from this construction side. With Baca finding that pick on to Cho, though, that's going to make things a bit easier. Feeding a kill to the Goyo is not going to make the life of UC San Diego looking even prettier as we get forward in round number seven. And as this construction, construction pressure builds and Pudgy Wudgy just lines up the head of Widget who is just staring into construction, this roller coaster of a round could very well be swinging in UC San Diego's favor here. This round's gonna come down to gunfights and micro-positioning. Strategy, I think, has kind of gone out the window at this point, but it's still a little bit too early to tell. The attackers have done enough to open up the construction wall with the exact same fallacy that Boston was in attack. They have no crossfire potential. They're doing a linear execute through one door frame. Now, fortunately for them, they're able to create a new door, but it's still on the west side of this map. Room Room needs to get the opening duel. He needs to find an insertion point in the red stairs. He's just too focused on a potential flank from Raptor that isn't coming yet. The attackers need to start to win their gunfights. They're going to be successful in that sharp over since his life. And all of a sudden, UCSD just bulldozes their way into the bomb site. It's going to be a close round. The bomb's starting to go down. Cryptic's looking at every direction. He's denied the diffuser. And it's a sea of orange as Boston comes back from the brink of... Woo, what a way to close out that round. The scoreboard was lighting up all UC San Diego, and then Boston just turned it around in the closing moments to find themselves their fourth round win. Now, the problem with both of these teams here is what we saw on that attack was simply a hold angles and wait for the defenders to peek into you strategy. And while that would pretty much never work, in most times in competitive siege, in this case, Boston decided that they dis they would like to present as many free kills as possible to UC San Diego. They did that. The scoreboard lit up blue, but then the gun skill of Boston prevailed in the end. The micro positioning, like you said it, Chief, did win out the day, and Boston will now take the lead for the first time in this map. I'm still perplexed by how some of these attackers are winning rounds. Their, their strategy has gone out the window. They are struggling to find the truth. Like, the thing is, it's hard to break down a round when strategy was tossed away and they're just winning gunfights off macro positioning. And fine by them. You know, you have to take your victories no matter how small, no matter how good they are. Your whole job is to win rounds your whole job is to win this series and go to grand finals you can win in different levels of fashion i think this series today whoever ends up winning needs to be one of those wins where you go back to the drawing board you learn from all your mistakes you analyze your play and you better yourself when you go into the grand finals because if you're having a, an attacking round where you're struggling to open up walls well why is that how do i make these positions better and honestly jay-z my concern is one of these teams that's gonna walk away today we won we're the better team today we don't need to self-analyze if you have that mindset where you win and you forget about self-analyzing you're going to fail in every aspect of life that's the most important thing whether or not you're studying for an exam playing basketball or racing cars you have to be self-analyzing i mean it is it is absolutely crucial right and, and you brought up the other element at play here which i think is so important i mean these teams don't just have their eyes on this particular map of course that is on the forefront of their minds but the grand finals is just around the corner and a brutal Oklahoma State team is waiting for them. So not only does a team have to prove their worth here in this semifinal to get on through, but they have to prove that they have what it takes to take down Oklahoma State, who are surely going to be watching this match. And right now, well, they should be smiling. The mistakes we're seeing from both of these teams are a little bit too much to bear and a little bit 
really what's been painting the picture of these rounds have been the mistakes rather than the excellent plays that you like to highlight, that you love about Siege. It's all about those highlight moments, those big brain plays from these players. And if mistakes are characterizing the series rather than flashiness, sometimes it is, it, it do be like that sometimes, Chief, but it is unfortunate when it comes down to that point. Oh, he was still able to open up the hatch. I thought is he didn't so he had to cook the frag grenade just perfect to destroy this patch but it's gonna be answered back by boston who is still electing to go for the impact trick the strategy has fallen away just slightly but it's still just as effective as it ever was tons of xkyras have been destroyed and another set will be destroyed the hatch will remain hard and widget is going to be hunting for kills now fortunately for habana the rework has paid off where they're only allowed to basically change the X-Kyra pellets into three by two, two by two, or one by two. In the old days, you only had six by two, and well, three impact grenades were enough to destroy her entire gadgetry. Yeah, I can't believe, I guess it wasn't as much of a factor, you know, just a couple of metas ago before the rework to Habana, because the fact that we're seeing so much impact tricking and still the attackers are able to get the kitchen hatch open, it is it is incredible. Because not only do you have to bring so many impact grenades, but you're losing a lot of utility as well. It's Boston who are losing sight control, and Widget goes for the ballsy retake, but Room Room shuts it on down. AG Meow lines up another cutting down Alpaca, and it is a 1v4 for the Goyo. Baka looking to find the big clutch here, but with the Diffuser now on the ground, it is a tough post-plant situation. You've got one player playing vertical. Baka elected to challenge on that player as the first part of this retake checklist. Playing this passively is not the answer. He's got to get aggressive and he's gonna do that. He's gonna go for the swing and line up the headshot onto one. The air jab will identify his position and now it's gonna have to be vertical play utilized by the defense. He's gotta peek this hatch, find a couple of lucky kills and go for the miracle play, but he is simply out of time. Far too slow, not enough time to make it happen. A brilliant attacking round from UC San Diego and they are gonna equalize here at four to four. I love that send down the top match. I've called it the French style of execute. Not quite exactly what UCSD brought out. The French style of play is to utilize those smoke grenades to die lines of sight. And that hot drop was, I think, again, a little bit too risky for San Diego. Sure, it worked for them. That was just because Boston was unprepared for that level of aggression. You do that against a little bit more of a confident team. They are going to be sitting, waiting for that audio cue of you to leave the lip of the hatch, which makes a audio cue a different type of sound before you even hit the ground. And they're going to be swinging on you before your feet touch the ground. And... Again, Boston is just not prepared for them. That's going to be on them to make those adaptations. I like how they were utilizing their Kaid Claws, but even better for San Diego and how to actually break down those Kaid Claws. Again, we're talking about why on earth was Boston not bringing sets of frag grenades. They are so critical, not only to destroying well defenders, but also their gadgetry. Well, you mentioned the French style of attack, and I, I really do like to see that attack in play. It shows that an attacking team really planned out their execute and they know what they're doing, but with the full hatch drop, without utilizing those smokes, without electing to bring a happy towel, probably the most crucial operator and a staple of that French style of attack that you call it, Chief, we're not seeing that come out from either of these attacking teams. And once again, we're not seeing it come out from the UC San Diego. It hasn't seemed to matter, of course, as they just found attacking success on this basement bomb site. But going to it again, considering that Boston are likely to make some sort of adaptation here, we're going to have to see what UC San Diego are going to be able to bring. It was a very one directional attack. It was kitchen, kitchen, and then let's add a little bit of focus onto kitchen as well, right? The three-pronged kitchen approach, which ends up only being the one prong of an attack, but it ended up working out. The frags were there. The site control was forfeit by Boston, and UC San Diego simply did a great job of identifying the situation and executing when Boston provided them with an opportunity. That is what you love to see from a team, even if it's their team is making some mistakes, you love to see a team assess the situation, 
realize what the best course of action could be and making the appropriate steps to deal with it. I'm a little concerned once again, we see UCSD. They have their entire map for free. A well-placed drone economy and a good roam clear will clear that relatively quickly. It shouldn't take more than a minute to identify that and start to crack open the hatches. I guess they're only about five seconds behind, but again, like we said in previous rounds, five seconds can start to compound, and they're also gonna have to start to go for flash dumps simply because we said that will my in play. Curious though, no Jaeger. Jaeger is one of those operators that's still not only in ranked, but in competitive play has almost 100% pick rate just because he's so darn impactful. And there we go. The hatch K claw has now been removed and it should be open season to start to send those X-Kyro pellets on that hatch. They're still gonna have to deal with impact. The impact grenades are going to start to rain on up, so Cryon Axe will be devoted to this kitchen hatch for at least the next 30, 40 seconds of the round. It's Widget who will be devoted to camera duty after getting cut down by Pudgy Pudgy. A good shot there with the L85 to send the Legion to the six-foot grave. You cross the minute mark, you still see the impact tricking going down. Cryptic will now forfeit the position and will rotate around towards the church. That's going to mean the kitchen hatch is going to be wide open, and that's going to mean we are going to have to see how UC San Diego elect to make their execute. It seems that, at least for now, we've got four players stacked up in kitchen, one player in dirt. It's going to be the same execute we saw in round number eight. How are Boston going to adapt? We're going to see it right now. Here comes the full send. Cryonax finds one, taking down Sharp. 5v3. Alpaca going for the retake here. He'll find one. Baka with a C4 will find another. But with the diffuser going down, no answers to be found. Alpaca takes down AG Meow. And it's going to be this retake coming in from Baka. The swing. And the headshot is delivered on a one. He's looking for the second as Pudgy Wudgy is off the board. But Chow is not going to be found. It's Alpaca from above. Who takes down. Actually, no. From Box 1. He's going to take down Chow. And now it's room room all that remains he's playing vertical he's got the advantage but three defenders still remain this vertical angle will be there but they have to play together baka almost got to get it off and he will he'll absolutely get it off oh no an absolute blunder there from uc san diego despite the actual the, the opening being there right above the goyo's head the angle was not swung by the ash and boston will take the round Jay-Z, confirm with me on that one. The, the ace had smoke grenades, right? Yep. He, he still had them in his back pocket. You're bringing an operator that has a great gun. Important utility. Use the darn utility. Please. Imagine if you sent those smoke grenades down range. You would have cut off line of sight. Boston would have not been able to go for the retake. You would have been able to sit back and relax. Something I don't like about UCSD is executes. Also, they send their entire team down kind of into the pits of despair. And they're like, good luck when your gunfight's down there. And you're never going to be able to leave there. And if you do leave, it's most likely in a body bag. And UCSD gets slaughtered one by one. Also, Room Room, phenomenal player on his team. He wins the majority of his gunfight. Yet, where was his coverage on the hatch? He was far too passive. He needs to be holding that angle the entire time. Another oversight has cost both of these teams back and forth round losses. And it, and it just seems to be the motif. You need to think about your utility. You need to think about your executes. Because, honestly, the attacking from both these teams is just... Brutally honestly, sloppy. And br the brutal honesty that we are, are throwing out there in the booth. I mean, of course, we love to see criticism. these teams. Constructive criticism. That's exactly right. And it's important that when you approach this as if, if you're a team doing VOD review or you're a player watching, we are not criticizing these teams simply for the sake of being mean. That's not why we're here. We are here to assess the situation we've got in front of us and determine why a certain moment is going well and why things are going wrong and how these two teams can adapt going forward. That's why we're highlighting these simple steps that these teams can get underway. Some pretty easy fixes to a couple of uh, issue areas that these teams are struggling with on both sides of the this map and we're going to see here again in round number 10 we're going over to cctv and cash and the adaptation is going to be the story of the round i talk about it every time i cast because it is so important to highlight the ability of a team 
of an IGL to say, we need to change up our strategy, not only within the round, but between the rounds, between maps. That is what separates the good teams from the better teams, from the best teams at the top of Siege. That's why pro teams are who they are, because they can look at a situation, look at a team, not only counter strat them, but change up their strategy on the fly in accordance to what they're dealing with. Bach on an extremely aggressive angle. That's one of those positions where it can work sometimes. But again, it's not an 80-20 gunfight. It's about a 50-50 gunfight. I prefer for defenders to not make those swings unless you have true information, which the defense of Boston did not. Now, Widget will be a better smoke than his counterpart on the other roster, staving his utility. He understands that he is being pressured from CCTV window, but he has a crossfire from Alpaca in the top of Crafter. And if he gets pressured as well, he can also call in from additional reinforcements, not only from the box, but as well as from the red stairs. So the coverage for Boston is looking strong, and you see is going to have to start to change something up. Setting up a crossfire. We start to sound like a pro record at a certain point, but both these attacking teams are making the same mistakes and forgetting the most important, the most critical part of Siege is your crossfires. Well, AG Meow's gonna find the head of one of the second kill reigning in the board for Pudgy Wudgy. He's gonna find one. AG Meow, the jump in 51. Window's gonna net him one kill. Widget, a quick answer, but he's gonna stare in the face of the ace and Pudgy Wudgy is gonna cut him down for that mistake. You see San Diego find a way, despite the odds, to equalize and waiting for the 22nd meta to come into full effect has been the story of all of these attacks, but it is working out for these attacking teams as once again, we've got an even split on this second half. I have a concern that the minds of these teams are, our attacks are working, which means they are good. And, and, and truly the attacking team, the attacking both, both attacking teams are making far too many mistakes. They have no business winning gunfights. And that's also partly on the defense, too. The reason the defense is losing, they're either getting too aggressive or they're too passive. They have no understanding of when to be aggressive or not to be aggressive. And we talk about Cafe, which is banned. We won't be seeing it in this series. But Cafe started a concept called the stage drill where you hold map real estate and you work your way back to your bomb site in what's referred to as stages and a stage is a buffer room or a certain part of the map this design is to waste time waste attack for utility and snipe away drone if you were to couple a strategy like that in here where you're staged roaming working your way back to your bomb site San Diego would have no business winning that round. Why? Well, they would have had no utility to go for the execute. They would have had no drones. They would have to go for the face check. And they're just not going to win those gunfights. At least on paper, they should not win their gunfights. But nonetheless, both of these teams able to do perplexing executes. Well, neither team really has done much of a roam. We've seen, you know, a, a five-man anchor strategy every round. And that is why these rounds can be so nonsensical when it comes down to the execute because there is very little linear progression to the overall shape of the round it's literally nothing happens for the entire round and then all of a sudden when the execute goes down it's the gunplay that shines at the end of the day we're seeing a little bit of utility utilized in the early rounds we are seeing the walls be eventually get opened up but it's coming down to some 1v1 gunfights at the very end of each round. And because it can be so 50-50, it's no surprise that we're seeing the entire map go 50-50 in every round seemingly go back and forth. There hasn't been one specific thing that either of these teams have done where you can point your finger at and say, this. This is the reason why they are winning. This is the reason how they've gotten this far in the Open League playoff. There isn't that one element we can talk about. It's all about these gunfights, these closing moments, and you can't really assess which team is outbraining the other and which team is simply better when there are these 50-50 gunfights that could very well go the complete other way just one round later. I'm sure I'm gonna get flack for this one, but I think the brain power has left the chat right now. It's just it's just muscle memory and it's it's just mechanical skill that are winning rounds. Because again, strategy 
just isn't there. They're just making far too many mistakes. Now, I will give Room Room some credit. He has great placement with his Ash Breaching Larches. He has destroyed some of those shields. And Budgie Wudgie able to get the opening kill. That's a step in the right direction when you've killed Cryptic the Jaeger, who has no real utility. His utility was placed throughout the map. Now, Sharp Falling with a set of our single Nitro Cell is a good kill. It's going to be a great way of denying entrance into the bomb site since San Diego is pushing linearly. But they're going to have to compound that into more kills. And the lack of reinforcement over by Red is starting to cost Widget his life as bullets are whizzing around him. Well, now we do have two picks early on in this round, which is something you could not say for many rounds prior at the 30-second mark. It's going to come down to this execute, but right now, UC San Diego are looking good. They've got the two-man advantage, and now... They just have to deal with some of these hard stuck defenders. That's going to be room room to deal with one. Room room gets another. And it's all going to be up to Alpaca. He'll line up one. Finally removing room room. But Chow, the swing in from the CC window is too much for the defense to handle the red stairs push as well. Those two simple angles were too much for Boston to deal with. And UC San Diego will not only take round 11, but now they have match point. Well, that's a step in the right direction. Basement is going to unlock, and San Diego looks strong on this map. They have a good understanding of what they want to execute and how to execute this. And if all honesty, the best attacks we've seen out of any of these rosters has been downstairs, and that was from San Diego. It's simply because they're able to win their gunfights. And I, I think this game is kind of going to a monkey see, monkey do. We've seen professional players utilize this strategy before we've copied and pasted it into our strat books and that's the problem i have is if you watch a professional team and apply that strategy to your game in t2 in t3 or into collegiate play out understanding why the strategy was created and and the nuances to those strategies that strategy is null and void it is going to fail the majority of the time like with the ssg style roam Far too often do teams just bring it out against a roster that it shouldn't be brought out on. Or the French style of execute. They bring it out in a team that shouldn't be played on because they see the professionals utilize it and they think this is the ultimate strategy. This is the end all be all strategy and it's worked for the pros so it will clearly work for us. And again, I'm really concerned that UC San Diego is currently in that mindset because they are bringing the ace, they're not utilizing the utility, and they're not utilizing the smoke grenades. Now, hopefully they can prove me wrong since they have room, room, and play who also has access to a set of smoke grenades. Well, they're also going to be bringing out the Monty, a pick that can be probably as hit or miss as a pick could possibly get. You, you say that with pretty much every shield operator, Clash included, how hit or miss that pick can be, because not only do you need extreme coordination to make it work well but you need a good player on the shield who knows what they're doing the first time that we've seen baka actually go for an early challenge gonna spray on towards the bathroom and take a little bit of damage dealt towards cryonax on that push the solo push from the hard breacher through strip but nobody getting penalized for that gunfight but what i was saying about the monty pick is that not only do you have to play the shield well but you have to play as a team very well in order to utilize the Montan properly. You need to play off the shield using that intel, using the brick wall that the Monty can be to actually enable yourself to get a plant down. And on this basement bomb site, if you're going for a vertical play, shields and vertical play do not mix. Shields should be walking in on a flat surface, not doing any drops down from a hatch. They should be walking down a staircase into the bomb site and pressuring from there. But right now, Room Room will be just staring down the kitchen hatch, gaining some intel before rotating around to dirt now that that has been opened wide by the Selma charges that Chow is rocking. I'm glad he's going to dirt. I was going to, like, rip my hair out if he didn't work his way to dirt. That is a power position for the defenders. They're going to be able to swing you as you go for your legendary hatch drop. They have a sledge in play, who has decided he does not want to swing his sledgehammer and utilize his utility whatsoever. 
why you bring a sledge on this map, again, is for those nades, but also for the vertical swing so you can remove Cryptic from this position. A huge oversight, but the attackers are just working their way to the bomb site. They have control being facilitated by the Monty. The opening pick has fallen, not in favor of Sharp, who's lost his life, and it's going to come down to when the bomb gets put down. Where is Cryro? Go for the drop. It is your time to shine. Yeah, with the, ki the kill raining out from Boston as well, Alpaca making it happen here. Room Room going for the aggressive play, unleashing the shield, actually dropping it off and pushing onto Alpaca. It's not going to find a kill. It's Widget who finds a kill in the meantime, and the Monty wins the battle. Room Room will cut down the Kaid as Widget finds another kill on the board. Oh, the planter gets cut down just in the nick of time. Baka on the late rotation into the back of Arsenal is going to find the kill. And Room Room on 14 kills is all that's left. And the C4 will send him sky high and keep Boston in this fight. We've got overtime on our hands. Oh, boy, Jay-Z. Oh, boy. I'm trying to select a descriptor word that isn't going to be too critical of the San Diego boys Let's go with and girls. Tomfoolery. Tomfoolery is an excellent way of putting that round because that was an abomination. My lord. <laughs> San Diego. That <laughs> it was that bad, my friend. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sugarcoat anything. San Diego did everything right. They attacked it beautifully perfectly that round was the best round i have seen out of san diego state or not san diego state you see san diego until they're like you know what my kd needs to be padded i want to get kills monty's solo pushing into blue is perplexing imagine if he was locking off ashwell imagine if he was locking off the rotation over between the A and B bomb site. Imagine if he was sitting by the boxes. Boston would covering have the planter, never... Maybe. Covering the planter. <laughs> Absolutely. Indubitably. If he was doing anything other than honestly playing selfishly and kill hunting over in blue, that round would have been San Diego's victory. They would have won this series and they would have gone to map two. That oversight and that selfish play was something that, that's brutally unacceptable and that's something that they cannot do if they want to be successful in Collegiate or in T3. Also, the fact that Cryer was slow to drop when his teammates had control, he would have got the plant down because the Nitro Cell rang out when there was two seconds left on the plant. The attackers had control for 10 seconds. I'm a finance major, but quickly doing that math, the bomb would have been down. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned how perfect it looked for the most part. I agree with you wholeheartedly. They assessed in the previous round on that attack what worked and what didn't. They realized, okay, let's just send a Monty in dirt and we're going to have site control. They did. They had site control right away, but they sacrificed it by a couple of mistakes that uh, I think, Chief, you uh, astutely highlighted. So I don't need to go into depth any further. Our focus shifts now to overtime it's six to six everything is on the line here this is exactly how you want the semifinals to go you want them to come down to the wire maybe not quite like this but you love to see a close match like this between two teams vying for their ticket in that championship match it's going to be a basement attack for uc san diego again and a basement defense for boston the impact tricking that's going to be a factor from Cryptic. He's going to be looking up through this hatch, and Cryonax is going to be looking to deal with it. And for the time being, he's going to full flash himself to make it even more of a pain to get this impact trick going or get this Habana pellets going onto the hatch, but it remains hard. It remains electrified as well, and so that's going to have to be swiftly deal dealt with by Pudgy Wudgy. He's done this pretty well for the most part. He's gotten this Kaid Claw off. We're going to have to see him do it again. He's going to cook the nade. Almost going to roll on through, and it's not actually going to catch out the Electro Claw. So the hatch, still a problem, and it does appear that UC San Diego realizing that they should not deal with it. They should go for a, what looks like a four-man main, main stairs push right now. 
No crossfires whatsoever from UC San Diego. And Pudgy Wudgy still has yet to even swing his sledgehammer. He finally does it with under 60 seconds left. It at least happened, so I can't be that critical. But if he did it sooner, Sharp wouldn't be hiding in the west corner of Armory. He would have lost his line sooner. And it's going to be a YOLO sin from San Diego. They've wasted all their time standing in the hatch. Why? Because they're not really understanding how to push. Again, if you want to plant in the B-bomb site, phenomenal. That's actually an optimal way of planting like we've been highlighting. But you have to have a plan to actually get that control. San Diego in round 13 is not showing to me that they have an understanding of how to take control of the B-bomb site. And they're about to send it through every available door frame. There's 11 seconds left. The sin hasn't happened yet. Sharp hiding the corner is able to find one. But fortunately, the answer back from San Diego is a little bit better. A have control B. What on earth is going to happen with a swing? And there it goes. Boston wins off time. Brilliant swings from Alpaca. Another oversight by the def or the attackers. Alrighty. Well, around that happened. It did happen. And now we're sitting post-round. And I think we'll keep it at that. It's now overtime match point. Boston have the lead, but now they have to attack. And they're going to have to attack what appears to be Church and Arsenal. Getting this attack to be successful, it's all about doing so efficiently. Getting through your checklist efficiently. Your first step on that checklist, identify if there are any roamers. If there are, clear them out or kill them. Get control of the first floor. The next step on that checklist, get open the hatches, get open the walls. Either it's dirt tunnel, either it's blue, either it's moto hatch or kitchen hatch. Figure out where your approach is going to come from. Normally, teams will come into the round with an idea of that anyway. They'll have a strat in mind, but often the good teams will assess the situation, realize where they should correct their attack from, and build and execute from that point. It's all about getting that done quickly. It's not something that UC San Diego did in the previous round. They struggled getting Kitchen Hatch open with the nades, and they decided, maybe we should send it down main stairs. Oh, maybe we should go out to the Kitchen Hatch and stand over there for the remainder of the round. Oh, you know what? Let's all go through dirt. As you can see by my analysis of it, it's a lot of changing your mind about how you want to approach the site. And with... A, a defense that is setting up a lot of utility, that is ready for your push, there's nothing you can get done in 15 seconds that you could, if you couldn't get it done in two minutes. The meta that is shifting is shifting more attacker side, and it's doing so because there is less utility to deal with. Well, my has been changed, Jaeger has been changed, you don't have to spend as much time clearing out utility, it's no longer the utility consumption simulator, the 20 second meta has come and gone. But these two teams clearly have their minds set on continuing that 20 second meta, on waiting for the last second. And it has some merit to it if you're using that time to gain information, to gain positioning and posturing at every turn. But what these teams are doing right now is simply too slow. It's too passive of an attack style to work out with more success than failure. That's why we're seeing these rounds go back and forth, and that is why Boston, despite being a round up here, they might have their work cut out for them. One minute burned, Rome clear checklist complete. So, Jay-Z, I have a solution to both of these teams' cross problems. You can call me a genius. My genius is unparalleled. It is referred to the M870 ACOG. You give that gun a nice little ACOG, and the shotgun goodness of Jaeger and Bandit will be increased. You can hold angles tighter. You can go for wide swings, and you're going to see everything in two and a half times vision. Now, unfortunately for AG, he will not be saying seeing anything with any type of vision as he's now dead, buried six feet under, and he was the Jaeger player, the one that has access to the M870. And imagine, he went for that gunfight. He went for the planes. He was in a position to save his team. He had a shotgun and an ACOG. He would have absolutely won that. And more members.
of the defense are starting to lose. Boston in a great position to win, but Widget cannot die. Challenging the boxes without frag grenade coverage or the smoke grenade coverage is just a bad play. Boston, one minute to go for this attack, and with the two-man advantage, things are looking good for an eventual execute. They're starting to position on this Moto side. They've got the hatch open, and they're starting to stun on in towards Pudgy Wudgy at the same time. You've got Alpaca and Widget working their way in from this Arsenal side as well. The smokes are going to be utilized. One's going to get burned, but the other is going to land and position right in front of Cryonac. But Pudgy Wudgy is going to shut down Cryptic, pushing in from one side. And the C4 from Cryonac will connect. Things are even in a 3v3 now. Boston now struggling. The Toxic Babes shutting one down. And the player in dirt who has not yet been dealt with is the thorn in the side of this attack. It's all crumbling for Boston as UC San Diego take a 3v5 into a 3v0. 7-7 seven seven equalizing. We've got overtime match point on our hands. Well, this is a predicament to be in. San Diego is going over to attack. And honestly, the attacking teams have been on a downward spiral, making just about every single mistake possible. And it's cost them dearly. But here at round 15, this round sets it all. All previous 14 rounds no longer matter. It's all about what you execute here. CCTV has been kind of the spearhead of these perplexing levels of attacking execute because they just cannot figure out how to open up the eastmost wall. You don't have a lot of options, but one option you do have that nobody's really tried is to bring the IQ. You situate your IQ over to the westmost window of CCTV, which is by the B bomb site. You bring out her little wall hacky device where she looks at the electric gadgetry. You see exactly where the K claw is. You shoot it from the exact same plane, a linear shot. It gets destroyed. You open up the wall. Now you can establish your crossfire. You then rotate over to construction. Now your crossfire is 180 degrees. You can forget about red because your crossfire from the breach that you open up from the east is strong. The breach you have from the west is strong, so red is now dealt with. And that exact same scenario can be reverse engineered and apply it over to the rafters position. However, both of these teams are struggling to identify those K-Claws. And hopefully San Diego, over the past 14 rounds, has learned from their mistakes. They have self-analyzed. And they're able to basically open up the East Wall. Time will tell. Well, you've got Room Room approaching from the west side, while you've got two, three attackers approaching from the east side. You've got one Roamer. Well... Not anymore, as Sharp is now going to take up a position on the top of Red Stairs, but you do have Cryptic, who is playing below, hoping to be that unknown factor, that critical clutch player for Boston, if need be. It's going to come down to the wire, and we know so, because we've seen it every single time. These teams love to push in those closing moments, and that is why it's simply going both ways. I know I've reiterated this several times throughout the night, but it is just so different than what we're used to seeing from these collegiate teams who have realized the new meta that they're in and have realized that they can actually get their attacking pressure going a lot sooner in the round. Dealing with Baca and Cryptic is going to be the first problem for UC San Diego, and that's Room Room positioned on the bar double door, waiting patiently for any defender to possibly overextend. That's exactly what Cryptic will do, not aware that AG Meow is pushing in from the bar. The trade will rain back and forth as Baca takes one down, but Room Room will make sure to go one for one. UC San Diego will maintain the man advantage, keeping Boston on the back foot. Well, you're saying that we haven't really seen a big roam play. Boston has brought it out in probably the most crucial round. It has slipped away from their fingertips, and it's now relying on them to defend with their anchors. Pudgy Wudgy has spotted the feet of one. He's going to go with one of the, those yellow pings. Room Room is going to send explosive sky high. But Widget wins the gunfight against Pudgy Wudgy. I, a huge oversight, a mistake being made all around again. We're talking about this. I Pardon me, it sounded like a broken record, but gunfights are being won that should never be won simply because people are just making preposterous mistakes that are just compounding and hurting. But 
San Diego's in a position to win it. They have the man advantage. It's going to be on how well they go for their plan. And if they're prepared for Alpaca to send a frag grenade down the range, Sharp won't have one, but he has control of cash room. Sharp going to go for the retake and shut down the planter. That's one, and the time is dwindling away, but Sharp is left in a 1v2. A double swing here is all that UC San Diego need. Instead, it's going to be one at a time. The first pick is going to go out, but nobody's going to find the kill. It's Room Room, who does instead. UC San Diego take round 15. The 14th seed prevails over the two seed on map number one of this semifinal. That... That was a series. I, I don't think there's another way of map. putting it. That, that, that was a map, you're right. The, the series isn't over yet. And, and I, I'm lost for words. I'm truly lost for words. That was that was the map. I think that's the best way of summarizing it. There There isn't a lot of descriptors that can be utilized. Hopefully Fair. we yeah. can go back to the drawing board for both these teams, learn from their mistakes, learn from their lessons and apply that to Orkin. Because what's scary to me is Oregon is more or less a very similar map to Clubhouse. It plays the same way. It requires you to do the same types of takes. And if we see that exact same things again, I don't know if my sanity is going to be able to keep intact. Same. I'm definitely in the same boat <laughs> with you there. Um, we're going to take a quick break, though, ladies and gentlemen, and we will recover the best we can. Hopefully these teams will as well, and we get a spicy Oregon because we did see a spicy clubhouse. So this semifinal is definitely shaking out. Stick with us. We will be right back.
Ladies and gentlemen, we are back and into the action. Once again, my name is Jay Wills, and Chief is joining me on the desk to witness the second semi-final match of the night, the second semi-final of this open playoff, or the open league playoffs. The winner of this match will, of course, go to face Oklahoma State, who just beat Kettering in a 2-0 series, a beautiful series as well. But going into this one, Chief, we're on Oregon now. UCSD squeaked out map number one. Any ideas of what we can expect for map number two? Or maybe less ideas and more upward hopes. <laughs> A lot of hope is going down range. It's going to start off with how the attackers take their control, how they break down the defense, and more importantly, utilize their utility. Honestly, in map number one, Clubhouse, far too often did we see attackers and defenders, for that matter, dying with utility or utilizing it in ways that just weren't helping. We would see smoke canisters being sent down range in the first minute of the round have no smokes at all after 90 seconds and would just be sitting there as smg 11 we would see sledges working their way on taking control utilizing their frag grenades brilliantly might i add but not actually removing the ceiling those types of mistakes could be amplified on a map like oregon and hopefully the four and a half minutes that we were off air was enough time for these teams to chat amongst themselves, have the IGLs start to break things down, talk to their support staff, have the head coach start to break things down, and be prepared to forget about the actions of map one and win map two for San Diego if you're a fan of them, or have Boston win this and make us go to map three. Yeah, you'd love to see a map three because it really shows that these two teams are grinding it out and the winner will absolutely deserve their spot in that championship match. But you've got to get through map two first. We've got to see how Oregon is going to unfold as well. And before the break, Chief, you mentioned how similar that clubhouse in Oregon can be in the type of attacking style that we are going to need to see unfold in front of us. And so UCSD, they definitely have the responsibility early on to not only display some strong attacks, but to set the pace as the attacking team. The pace in clubhouse was brutally slow, as I'm sure you're all aware. It was 20-second meta full in in, in, it, in its full effect and it was as brutal as the 22nd meta generally is to witness and cap but going into oregon a map that you generally can see a lot quicker executes i would love to see uc san diego start things off on the right foot dealing with this roam and getting a strong execute going on this top floor bomb site the thing with this site is you have to have synergy between your two hard breaches. Opening up North Attic will be standard. Budgie Wudgie will be tasked with that endeavor. Utilizing his Maverick Torch, he has two options. He can do two lines and remove the metal panel that way, or he can just draw a crescent-shaped moon and basically have the wall fall around him. He's going to go for the option of drawing the two lines, have Sophia destroy it with her impact grenade, and then now it's going to be crucial for Cairo on the other side of the map towards the south to open up the south game's wall. This way, the attackers will have a multi-angle crossfire. They'll be able to start to pinch the defenders, but they're also going to have to deal with the utility that Boston has pre-established, particularly those deployable shields over in the south pit of Attic. Well, the first nade is going to roll on through, hoping to force the pit player out. That's exactly what it will do. What? Sharp going to somehow, by some act of God, will be able to get the reinforcement up despite being constantly shot at from the player pushing up an attic. Sharp clearly has nine lives here, or at least two in round number one. And Boston, so far, find themselves on extremely on the back foot here. UC San Diego now have to get aggressive. They've got... A tremendous man advantage here. Use the attic control. Use that control of games to get an execute going. But it appears that it's going to be a passive style of attack here for UC San Diego. They're going to be holding angles, waiting for Boston to swing. That's exactly what Cryptic will do. But Sharp has 
a quick answer for that and will cut down Cryonax. A 2v4 now as the attackers are bearing down onto the bomb site, but Widget lines one up. Sharp narrowly misses the head onto one, but Chow is gonna use this opportunity to put the bomb on the floor. The picks are gonna rain on true for Pudgy Wudgy and Meow as well. We'll cut down Widget. So you see San Diego not waiting till 20 seconds, one minute on the clock when their execute got going. No coincidence that they found their attacking success. Oh boy. I mean, great execute by San Diego in all honesty. They had a mastery of what the defenders were utilizing. They understood their strategy and they had a coherent way of breaking down that utility. Something that we haven't seen at all in map number one. If San Diego is able to constantly break down every single component that Boston brings, this is going to be a swift map of Oregon. However, Jay-Z, I have a sneaking suspicion that was a one-off attack. I'm fairly confident we're going to be seeing at minimum overtime and to probably put icing on the cake, I'm calling map three right now. You are? You're gonna you're gonna do that well. I don't know. I mean, we're seeing UC San Diego. They've got one round under their belt, and it was an attack that looked pretty strong. I've got to say, they really they dealt with the roam. They didn't get caught out by it, and they used that pressure to get onto the site. Sure, it wasn't as clean as we would have liked, but overall they got the job done. And it was Boston who looked pretty flustered when it came down to the wire. So. An interesting prediction, and one we're going to have to see shake out going forward, but just like Clubhouse, attacking wins are critical on Oregon, and with one round under their belt, UC San Diego going to be looking to continue that pressure as we get forward in round number two. Now, I would like the attackers to spawn one of their teammates over to the west side, which is Junkyard, and that way you open up big window. You don't have to go for that execute, but like we've been talking about throughout this series, probably more than I've ever said this word, crossfires are so key. And if you have big window open, the highway between the two bomb sites will be cut down. And even if you never actually elect to put an attacker there, the threat of having that window open will force defenders to be very careful when they go back to the fourth the sites. At minimum, they're just gonna look at the window and attempt to challenge you but most teams won't swing you at all. It's a great way of denying Nitro Cells because they won't be in a position to throw it. But nonetheless, San Diego is kind of slow on this execute. They did a great job of taking T3 in the first minute of the round, Rumor utilizing vertical destruction to remove those Kai Claws. Now he is aware that there's some lurking pressure from Alpaca, but no gunfight is ready to transpire. Vertical pressure that you mentioned now the closet wall has allowed to be open up this time You see San Diego going for a more methodical approach really opting to establish like you said chief that games crossfire That requires that three-pronged approach prong one the closet wall prong two attic control prong three trophy presence That's exactly what the attackers are going to try to establish here, but Sharp is standing in the way of UC San Diego and they're out of control. The nades are going to rain out and pop the Goyo shield, so Sharp is forced to retreat and tuck here in pit. Several ADSs to support it, but the Wub Wub will reveal the position of these attackers as they push on up. The C4 could be huge, but it's going to miss, what? and the jump over from the Maverick and the hipfire will find Sharp and Pudgy Wudgy claims Attic for his own, with Widget finding the grave down but not out but still in a brutal position to be revived. And with Room Room finding a pick here on Tabaka, things are once again looking very clean for UC San Diego, continuing that pressure from Attic. That's the Maverick of Pudgy Wudgy. You've got a player in Trophy, and you've got a player on Closet. The triple crossfire established, getting the bomb down is the next step. But the pre-placed Toxic Canister is gonna cut down one. Alpaca, the follow-up onto Room Room. It's now a 3v3. It's now a 3v2 as Cryonax cuts down one more defender. The bomb going down once again, but a swing with a bearing nine does not work, and they're gonna line up for Widget. He gets a double kill. It's all up to AG Meow in a 1v2 post plant situation. 
No HP in the side of Boston, so one shot will be enough. AG is going to inhale a ton of toxic gas, forced to rotate away. His loud coughing will alert members of Boston. He's over by the pit sign. Go for the stun block. Send your lifelines down range. And there it goes. Cryptic forced off the bomb, and it's going to prompt a wide swing for the members of Boston. Challenging one by one, they go. Cryptic's going to lose his life. And with 12 seconds left, the swing is successful. Widget with a brilliant headshot lines it up perfectly boss is able to win that a miraculous round again the attackers do everything right but they start to make very silly mistakes costing them a round win nearly got out of hand there for uc san diego in the closing moments they didn't quite play together on a double swing nor did they play it fully passive and cover the planter because the stun lock was just too much to deal with overall Job well done for UC San Diego for the most part, but Boston almost, almost didn't, didn't make it happen in the end. But at the end of the day, it was Boston who pulled it out with a good clutch in those closing moments. So a good defensive response, despite that round being so back and forth, it will be the defenders who pull out that kids and dorms victory. So going forward now to the basement site, it's laundry and supply room once again, we're going to talk a lot about crossfires on this bomb site. The amateur way of attacking this one, but one that is seen at higher levels of siege, is a full J bunker send. You stack your attackers outside of construction. You push on through, taking control of that. You open up the pony wall. You get pillars control. All of a sudden, you've got a multi pronged crossfire onto supply room. Your second approach is a freezer and laundry take, one that uses that freezer and laundry wall to establish a crossfire there. You get a plant down, all of a sudden it's an impossible post plant position. Both of these strategies, very viable for the attackers to unfold, but only one of them, rather than both, can be utilized in one particular round. Sometimes teams like to really overextend and go for all of the above, per se. A player in, in construction, pushing J Bunker. A player above on E-Box Hatch. Freezer and Laundry all in the same. It's all about applying a 180 degree crossfire to one specific bomb site and getting an efficient execute to follow it. You know what? I would love to see what a rush would create here. Because the attackers are struggling with time management. They're doing a great job of winning their gunfights. It's just... They can't seem to understand how, when, and where to plant their bomb. But if you go for a rush, you're gonna get a lot of map control. Well, for free, since you're rushing, you're gonna take a lot of gunfights. There's no guarantee that you win those gunfights. And that's basically the way San Diego's playing. They're, they're not really participating in mini games. They're not dealing with the mini games, at least efficiently. And they essentially do a 20 second rush. Imagine if you did the 20 second rush at the first 20 seconds of the round instead of the last 20 seconds of the round. It could be completely different. Again, just theory crafting at this point, but the world's kind of up in arms here. You can do whatever you want to do. And Pudgy Wudgy standing on electrified hatch, losing more than 25 of your HP is not the optimal way of opening a hatch. You can do it from a prone angle. You can do it from a crouching angle like you're doing now. However, what you were doing earlier was not really accurate. Actually, he'll get the hatch open, although 50 HP is what it cost for the Maverick wielding that Surrey torch. And we talked about the plan of attack for this bomb site. It does appear that it will be that Pillars and J Bunker take. You still have the player in J Bunker itself though. Alpaca is still positioned there. The flashes are gonna finally rain on through and Alpaca will smartly rotate away, go for the reinforcement to play time even more. So far, a brilliant job done by Boston. They are locking down this site and they refuse to be caught out in any unnecessary positions. Chow is gonna have to be the first one to go for the swing. The E-Box swing will not net a kill, more damage dealt to the attackers instead. A nade's gonna force Cryptic to back off, but he will re-challenge, as will Sharp, swinging on E-Box, and that is gonna result in a team kill on the side of UCSD. Sharp will follow that right up by finding Chow, a triple kill for the team, a quad as Widget and Sharp line up some more. It's gonna be all up to Cryonax in a 1v5. Well, at least Baka is down. That's a positive in this round. 
it's gonna be an impossible position to be in. A slammer shot alpaca too aggressive, absolutely eviscerated, losing his life, but Cryro on so little HP. One breath of that toxic gas will be his undoing. One bullet will be his undoing. But it actually looks like Father Time will be his undoing. As he's going to sit back, relax, hold an angle, and allow the clock to expire. Padding his stats and preventing himself from dying. That's the way of playing around and another position. Imagine if San Diego State went for the rush early on. They wouldn't have had to deal with the mini games because they've either slaughtered all the defenders or they themselves would have been slaughtered. A fair point. And you mentioned we're just theory crafting at this point, but at some point you got to take a step back and look at, you know what? Why don't we apply this strategy earlier? Why don't we mix things up, completely change things around? I mean, I don't think we're at that point yet for UC San Diego. They look so good in those first two attacking rounds, although the scoreline may not fully reflect that. Going forth to round number four, it's the tertiary bomb site finally rearing its ugly head after three round or two rounds in a row for Boston. Now, the tertiary bomb site debate, Chief, is one that we've had many a time and one that NA and the EUL Pro League teams also debate quite a bit. Which of the tertiary bomb sites do you prefer? Is it kitchen and dining or kitchen and meeting, Chief? I'd love to hear your take. So, I prefer meeting rooms simply because half the individuals, half the teams, doesn't matter if you're an upper echelon T3 team, fails to understand why you go to dining room. Your objective in dining room is to burn attacker utility. If you're able to destroy those ex pellets through impact tricking, that is an asset that you have. The thing is, most teams don't understand that, and... Some teams are fully reinforcing the showers where Sharp is. Sometimes they don't set up their murder holes. Sharp has yet to do so, or at least one of his teammates yet to do so. So just judging by the setup alone from Boston, I prefer meeting room. Now, meeting room, the bomb site itself is an island. It's very difficult to hold, but it's also very difficult for the attackers to enter it. It's, it's honestly a no man's land. And whoever has control of it, good luck controlling it. The only way you can control it is basically from outside the grapes and the middle of nowhere, which is can be a power position because if you couple that with good crosshair placements, deployable shield, and wasting time and utility, meeting room should be your primary bomb site. But the hole that dining room has been established by Boston should be free range from San Diego to open it up. They should have control right now, and yet they failed to make that identification. They're going to be slowly working their way up in small tower instead. You've got Xiao holding this long angle and once again punishing the Malusi for the overaggression. But Baka and Cryptic line up a double kill between the two and they will take down AG Meow and Room Room on that vertical clear. It seems that half the attackers are not going to bother with the vertical clear. They're going to send it straight in a small tower, straight in a shower's corridor and pressure directly onto the bomb site. Now... While this could be a more efficient way of approaching this site, if you're not committing fully to the top-down clear, why commit to it at all? You've now given the defense free kills, and you've now enabled them all to rotate back to site and have a five-man defensive presence, not to mention some vertical presence as well. Chow going for the walk into site play, and it's going to cut down the Malusi, who is already at one HP, but finishing off the only victim of the Nomad so far. 1 minute 15 on the clock. Baka holding a long angle towards dining. We've got four defenders simply waiting for this inevitable full send to come on through. And you've got Chow simply hanging out in dining room waiting for any defender to walk in fully unaware. But Boston are doing a great job playing this passive, waiting for the push to come through. It's going to come through now. Alpaca's going to line up one, taking down Show. That's going to be enough to scare Pudgy Wudgy off the diffuser plant, and he's going to get off, look for the kill, and get shut down by Alpaca as well. Cryonax in 1v4. Well, we've been here before. That was actually the previous round. And it didn't go well for Cryro at all. He's going to have to try to find more kills, and this time he won't have one down, and nobody's going to dry peek straight into him. He's going to take some damage, flicking to every possible position, but he doesn't really know where those shots are coming from. He's just reacting to the tracers. Back and forth he goes. He doesn't really have any options here. He's going to once again try to pay, pad his KED, saving the time and just sitting back, 
relaxing, attempting, waiting, praying, and hoping that member of Boston swings into him. And the fact that San Diego had control of showers, they didn't take vertical control, they lost the round as a result of it. They, ah, it's so frustrating that they, they, have, they can do everything right. Everything is handed to them on a golden platter, and the IGL of San Diego is just making identification errors. Well, the three v three to one. Now the split for Boston going ahead in round around number five. But so far, they're looking good. They're looking good on this defense. In part, of course, to their good setup that they've been bringing down into the passive style of play that they are bringing forward as well. If you see teams often in those man advantage situations they can get over aggressive and a 5v3 can turn into a 3v3 with the flick of a switch if you turn on that aggressive dial as well but boston have done a great job at simply getting the man advantage and then playing that out till the bitter end they're playing patient they are waiting for uc san diego to walk into the site unprepared unaware and simply just not ready to deal with a full five-man stack on the site of course utility will make that easier but at some point no matter the utility you have in pocket a 3v5 or a 2v5 it's going to be a tough situation regardless so back over to dorms we go and how will they elect to defend it's very similar strategies to me those goyo shields facing towards the east dying the attackers and entry point in through the trophy room and also that same old rotation by the south side of attic this is a good way of having that rotation We've seen it work before and i actually like how boston is attempting to go for the reinforcement as soon as attic has fallen they're getting very risky and not timing them as well as they should but they haven't lost any man count actually doing that so we'll have to see if they're able to find a different adaptation, Zulu pressure has been identified. Alpaca is the one roaming down there. This is going to be a great hindrance to Room Room as he tries to enter in through classroom. Well, Cryonax will be here on the support using the drone to just work a possible solo entry from the other side of the map with the Habana. This is something we've seen from UC San Diego several times on Clubhouse. The Habana like to go for the solo push in from Strip, and while this is something you rarely want to see. It's something that has generally gone unpunished from the side of UC San Diego. So if it ain't broke, why fix it? The mentality clearly at the forefront of this attack. In the meantime, you've got Pudgy Wudgy coming in from the attic side, doing a very efficient job at opening up the wall with the Maverick trick. Getting open that attic side and Alpaca lining up the head of Room Room and cutting down the Ash, a big pick to lose on in Z. Sharp gonna rotate around and take a look at the murder scene that we just witnessed but the focus for this attack will remain on the bomb side. you've got three attackers approaching from the attic side you've got one approaching from the big window big window pressure is important but how important will it be if you've got a single pronged approach all stacked up in attic chow's gonna swing on through a couple uh, bullets are gonna land on the nomad's back but nothing fatal now with the round nearing the one minute mark San Diego's gonna have to start to swing for gunfights. They can do this. They've been in great positions before. They're a mechanically gifted team, but the rotation of Cryro over towards the east might be a mistake. He had a perfectly laid crossfire, and it's going for the execute. Brilliant showing of mechanical skill by Pudgy Wudgy. Finds two quick insertions, and here comes Boston now in the back foot. They're gonna have to find out how to win this round. They have operators that have a single nitrocell that will be sharp on the Malusi, but Cryptic still could have toxic babes in his back pocket. Each one of those is good for 10 seconds of denial. And this is going to prompt members of San Diego to start to sit their drones down range for one final time, confirming the location of where Boston is playing so they can establish their crossfires. They can be prepared for their execute. Now the B-bomb site has actually been surrendered. The drone work wasn't good enough and San Diego hasn't confirmed that they're going for the default plan. Cho is going to take tons of damage. He's being choked out by the gas, but it won't be enough as a bomb has been confirmed on the deck. We're moving into overtime with both rosters and equal man count.
of 3v3 in the post plant now, but the defenders need to get aggressive. Now they've become the essential attackers forced to retake. Take extremely challenging gunfights. Cryptic looking for the player on repel, but smartly, that's not going to be a, a possible kill. Pudgy YG's going to get a quad kill and line up two. It's going to be up to Cryptic in a 1v3, and AG Meow has something to say about that. You see San Diego coming out of nowhere. They will take the round. What a great round. Honestly, I have to give props to Jaeger if we can dive back over to the caster cameras for one quick second. It seems like Jaeger has understood what was going wrong for him. He went for a gunfight where he decided, you know what, I'm going to challenge it in an appropriate manner. I'm going to go for a traditional swing. He didn't hold down mouse one or didn't hold down shift. That was the first time we've seen in this series somebody not shift challenging a gunfight like that. So, Alpaca. I applaud you, sir. Great showing there. However, the defense, again, just very passive. They want to hold their buff rooms, which is a great strategy. They retreat when they receive pressure, as they should. But when they have their back against their wall, they really don't know what to do. They don't know how to send their utility downrange, and that's something they're going to need to rectify. Well, going forth here, the final round of the UC San Diego attack and the last attempt that Boston have to get that 4-2 split on Oregon. A coveted split for any team on this map, but more expected for these defensive teams to maintain. If UC San Diego can get this third round, just like Clubhouse, I think we're gonna be in for a long one. This could go all the way if it's going to be as back and forth as it has been all night long one round away at least uc san diego say one round away from tying things up in round number six they're gonna to have to do so by attacking this basement bomb site last time the story was that pillars side push the rush as you called it middle of the round with about one minute to go we saw the e-box hatch drop the send in supply room did not work out too well at the end of the day for UCSD. A problem that they will obviously be looking to rectify going forward. Control being established by the attacking team of San Diego. This is their last attempt on attack unless we go in overtime. And if map number one clubhouse was any indication of that, overtime can be viable and it might be something that will work out well for San Diego since they were the roster that was able to win that miraculous play in OT. Their drones are going to start to confirm how Boston is holding this bomb site. It will be through an extension into J Bunker. It's going to be those ADSs of Alpaca designed and establishing that position where the deployable shield that was brought out by Cryptic is placed deep in the bunker. Three ADSs are going to deny all the projectiles and hopefully Alpaca's life will be spared. But ADSs have now been burned. Explosive utility can go down range. No explosive utility needed. Well, you can just walk to the shield and get your kill. Something you don't see every day, but it works out well for San Diego. Yeah, with the rotate not reinforced, Cryptic using this deployable shield, but over peaking and over aggressing, Cryonax finds the punishing blow. Sending the smoke off the board, that's going to be do wonders for a push that needs to resist any sort of plant denial. The C4, that's going to be wasted. His Chow is going to remain unscathed. He's going to find a double kill, cutting down Sharp. A 2v5. Widget and Baka left to pull this out for Boston. The Diffuser going down. Baka challenging the long angle. He'll down Cho. The Diffuser is going down on the C4. Just misses. Widget needs to get that C4 to connect to save the round, but it did not. It's a 1v4. Room Room cuts down one. Room Room gets the double kill. And UC San Diego even things out at three to three in round number six. An even-sided showing on Oregon. A map that is extremely defender-sided is an excellent position to be in when you are moving over to defense. We're now going to have to see what San Diego is going to bring out on their defensive phase. How are they going to look to hold? Well, they're going to start off with a basement defense. Two or one deployable shield, one traditional deployable shield is being shown by Pudgy Wudgy since he has a smoke. 
two explosive shields by Goyo. However, the six pick into a clash will change that entirely. We've seen this strategy before, particularly from Southeast Asia, where you bring out your clash and you deny entry based on tasing people and having a shield that is incredibly oppressive. Well, the shield play, I talked about it on Clubhouse, it can be very hit or miss. And on this bomb site, it is important for the clash to be very mobile because you need to identify first where the attackers are gonna come from and then you have to adjust to be the brick wall in their way. If it's a full construction push, very easy for the clash to just stand in front of that double door. Same thing for a pillar side take. But if they're working their way in from laundry and freezer, that's where things get a bit dicey for a clash player. Holding laundry no longer becomes an option because a freezer crossfire will shut down the clash immediately. Thankfully for the clash though, we don't have to go into that any further. It's clearly going to be what looks like a construction push all five attackers spawned, ready to go for a possible J Bunker send. Drones working their way out throughout the map. I love how Ebox and Clashes, that's such a great strategy because it's going to be difficult for her to take true explosive damage because the explosive device is most likely going to impact the soft wall and it's going to mitigate some of that damage. Not all of it, but it's going to be enough. Callie has her lance in hand, not her sniper rifle. She's gonna get swung, but Widget wins the gunfight. The reinforcement on the wall, Sharp needs to go for the challenge. He doesn't do that. He had himself the free kill lined up. His crosshairs are basically on him. He just didn't pull the trigger. I will say, I love the coordination between Clash here and the teammate. That was Cryro who went for the swing. However, it was just a little bit ill-advised, and Widget has now crashed, and hopefully he's able to return to the lobby since he was the one that had the opening kill. Yeah, that's going to keep the man advantage actually <laughs> fully neutralized, so that could be the saving grace for UCST. It will as Meow and Room Room find themselves two kills, shutting down Sharp and Alpaca and making this a 2v4. Baka Cryptic... All that remains of this push. Room Room is going to shut oh, one God. down. Only one more. Following the clash out in the J Bunker. An intimidating force, but the Sophia is ready. Being stunned constantly. The 416 from AG Meow will do justice to this Boston push. And UC San Diego will go on a multi round streak here, changing the scoreline from three to one, now to four to three in their advantage. And with that, we're going to have to dive actually over to Caster Cameras now this time to allow this rehost and break to be established. Now, we were talking about shift keys earlier, my friend. Here's a shift key. Here's the <laughs> other shift key. Oh, also, I don't know if I can show this on stream. There's a keyboard Ooh. with shifts no longer in it. So if you find yourself in a bad position where you're like, you know what? I can't help but always just sprint challenge everything. I want to be one speedy boy and you want to sprint away everything. My friends, ladies and gentlemen, this is the optimal play. Rip your keys away. Oh, and if you don't have a keycap puller, mechanical pencils work pretty good for it too. All right. Well, Chief, displaying your, your very own take that you've you've had on this matchup i mean in oregon i think it's been a little bit less of a problem i mean overall these teams have had a little bit more cohesive executes compared to clubhouse we haven't been seeing the shift challenges like you mentioned we haven't been seeing quite as much as that but we have been seeing honestly a lot of back and forth gameplay i mean this is the semi-final we've all been waiting for i mean it is coming down to the wire here and so I mean, for UC San Diego to not only take map one, but to go ahead on Oregon now four to three, starting off their defensive half strong. Honestly, I think it's a good sign for them going forward. Of course, there's a lot of things to clean up going forward, potentially against Oklahoma State in the grand finals, but the focus is still on tonight. They still need to get through Boston, the two seed, who also took down UTD, the team favored on this side of the bracket to go all the way. So Boston, it, it took quite a bit to do that. So clearly they have it in them to bring this one back and grind it all the way to the end. But only time will tell if they can actually make it happen. 
And with that, we're going to have to dive over to a quick rehost. We don't have an estimated time since it seems to be a lobby problem. Or I actually believe his computer has decided to fry itself. So Loaded, yeah. <laughs> we don't actually know how long it's going to be. So don't go anywhere. We're going to consult the admins and decide what's our next course of action. But until then, we'll be back hopefully soon. What can I do to make you
Ladies and gentlemen, we have returned. It was quite an interesting upside down, back and forth, but we have solved the issues. An emergency substitute has been called for Boston. Omega will now be filling in as primary hard support, and your favorite casters has returned. Jay-Z will be my partner in crime. Tango Omega Down will be our lead producer today. Now, Jay-Z, I have to ask you, how was your ice cream during the break? 
My ice cream was quite refreshing. I had some half baked from Ben and Jerry's. Please sponsor us. Um, and it was good. It was good. It's chocolatey. It's delicious. And I am hoping that that chocolatey goodness is going to help carry me through map number two. What we've seen so far has been back and forth as back and forth as map number one. It is a sweat, a sweaty one on Oregon. These teams have been so evenly matched so far. So the introduction of the sub, Omega being brought in, you think that that's going to shake things up a little bit and maybe this will go even more in UC San Diego's favor. What do you think? That is a possibility. The other concerning factor, though, is the fact that, well, Boston, with Omega filling on through, he doesn't know the strategies. He hasn't been scrubbing with the roster. He might not have the synergy. And if we go back to this series... That is what these teams are really lacking at. And, you know, I think there's a nice synergy here as well. We currently see a donut on our screen since the clean feed is loading. Everybody in the lobby has donuts. I'm starving to death, so a donut would sound delicious. So maybe we should just stop talking about food and ice cream. Well, see, I'm sitting here while this is scrolling, while you're you're doing a great job, Chief. I'm just sitting here eating my ice cream. So Can, you, can we get a play-by-play -play from your ice cream? Jay-Z so, with a so scoop, listen. he's dipping it on in, yep, yep. starting to salivate as it gets closer and closer to his mouth. A mm -hmm. quick close and lips will confirm the ice cream in his oh, yeah. uh, crevice? <laughs> I don't well, know. See. Your mouth hole? Yeah, there you go. There you go. See, oh, we're the back. thing is, right, the, the, the key of any ice cream eating, I think everyone in existence will agree the mini spoon is crucial. That is Why the, mini the spoon? core. That is the core part of any key ice cream bamboozle. Because listen, listen, the mini spoon, sure, it's it's a small, it's harder to handle in your hand, maybe. But but listen, you eat the ice cream at a slower pace. You get to enjoy it more because you're just every scoop you take is a smaller scoop at a time, so that you can really savor the entire experience of the ice cream because it, it, imagine you take a big a big ass spoon a big soup spoon and you just go up in there you've got three scoops of ice cream in a modest portion so i'm really stretching it out as long on, as i on. can the yeah. argument to that though is if you have a big soup spoon you can kind of lick it like an ice cream cone so you can consume it slower ah that's a bit you weren't prepared never, for never just like alpaca was yeah. prepared for his own death <laughs> beautiful transition there and i think you know, the one player off the board, you've lost your Habana, that is a massive pick. It is, honestly, honestly, I'm willing to call this right now. UC San Diego just won the round. There's no way that Boston should be able to win this at this point. Their only hard breach is off the board. You can't attack Attic. You can't attack Closet. All you can do is send it through some fatal funnels. Brilliant early pick from UC San Diego. That's going to find round number eight unless some sort of absolute disaster happens. It's a free round. And just like in CSGO, if you dry peek into an op, or in this case, a Cal sniper rifle, your forehead can be removed from your body. Cho almost lost that gunfight. He was just constantly jiggle peeking around that sniper. He will think better of his life and not go for that swing. He's rotated all the way over to trophy, an even awkward position. He is stuck between a multi-angle crossfire that could be established. Boston doesn't have the man count to yet establish that, so he is going to be safe at least temporarily, but it's still Chief, an listen, awkward Chief. place this should be. Yes, Chief. I made a terrible blunder, right? I go... There's only one hard breacher on the board. That being the um, the Habana, right? But see, oh, I, I didn't he, want to correct you there. I was gonna let you, yeah, you have to correct me there. I, I can't be that much of an idiot. Of course, there's an Omega well, on the you, board. Well, you to be. He's like, bringing, I, I just let you exist, man. <laughs> <laughs> He's bringing the thermite. I didn't look that far down the screen. I missed probably the most important part of that round. And that's going to be a huge pick on the board. It's all going bad here for Boston. UC San Diego pull it out. Pudgy Wudgy, a double kill. Amidst of my idiocy, UC San Diego still made it happen. They shut down Thermite as well, the second hard breacher, who was definitely a factor in the round. Despite the two hard breachers, Boston just couldn't make it happen. That's a great way of summarizing it. And it was just not checking your corners, not being prepared for every possible aggressive thing that the defenders can do. We're talking about pre-made bullet holes. Well, you always expect that wall to be open. However, you should never expect it to always be, or pardon me, it should always be closed. Most teams are reinforcing South Attic. 
However, we've actually seen a lot of teams start to experiment with leaving one of those south attic walls open because that's a great way for the defense to swing and directly challenge you in the attack of Master Bedrick. And sometimes attacking teams are slow with taking north attic or we've actually seen some professional teams elect to not take it at all instead of being favored for a big window south games execute really it's up to your creativity and speaking about creativity we're going to see the quaternary bomb site back over to kitchen and dining room and a great adaptation already being made by san diego they have pre-made murder holes they have a set of impact grenades so the lone hard breacher thermite which will probably be used on small tower the wall the other one if used over by the shower side will hopefully be murdered by impact grenades so they've got the shower set up down. The crucial part of this tertiary bombsite hold that we've talked so much about tonight. The question is, how much are Boston going to feed into that setup? Sometimes teams can simply circumvent this by going for your meeting room push, your typical execute that you would go for the kitchen side. Step one, vertical control. Step two, you use that thermite charge to get that meeting to kitchen wall open. Lo and behold, you have a long line of sight onto the bomb site, and you have security control, and the bomb site is yours. But it's all about the vertical control first. That's exactly why we see Baka, the Ash, first entering here through attic, supported by a drone, brilliantly playing off each other here. But you're going to need more than just one player on this clear. That's why Omega has joined the party. That's why Alpaca is coming in from closet as well. Forcing out this top floor extension is the first step to any successful tertiary bombsite attack. Duck as our poor Dapper Man himself. Room, room with nowhere to go. His teammate's going to fall elsewhere in the map. And that is going to be one of the SMG alone bros unable to reunite with his friend. Room, room is having his walls open up around him. AG is able to connect to one. Room, room is forced to go for the rotate. He should have stayed his ground a little bit longer, but I'm still okay with that rotation nonetheless, simply because late rotation has cost many a defender their lives in this series thus far. The pressure for the defenders are getting worse. A nice drop shot for AG is able to collect a third kill in this round. Now it is all on Baka. The Ash against four locked into the dorms bomb site. Just with nowhere to go. Just free fire in the white stairs. The death is imminent. It doesn't matter who gets credited. It'll be Cairo who does. But a great showing by San Diego. After this rehost, they seem to get better and better with age. Well, just like my ice cream is gone, Chief, I think the hopes for Boston may also be dwindling away. Is that it more is than now... a feeling? <laughs> what? <laughs> Continue. Just, just, just <laughs> on with you where you are. It, you think that Boston were really gonna, gonna bounce back here on Oregon. But the problem is they losing that player. I, I th who was the player? The player they right, lost. Hold on, we, we have to back up. I made a Boston <laughs> reference and you didn't get it. I, I didn't hear you. I just didn't oh, hear I, you. I, sorry, sorry, sorry. I said more than a feeling. You know, huh? Yeah. yeah. No, we're, we're just going to go past that one. I, 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 I mean, couldn't I, let that one pass. I, 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 I thought my school, was brilliant. I go to school in Boston, so I kind of, you know, feel the, the Boston vibes here. Yeah. But the vibes that Boston are now putting out with their <laughs> sub, it's just, it's just not the same sauce that they had earlier on. They're not quite as even with UC San Diego here. It's six to three, it's a match point, and it could very well be over for Boston here. The two seed felled by the 14th seed in the semifinals. Possibly, possibly could be the storyline here if Boston cannot get it together for three attacking rounds in a row. It's starting to look like that will be the case. And I have to say, as a fan of multi-shield strategies, the Chief is quite happy. There's three deployable shields being brought out. One non-explosive and two Vulcan shields that go boom. You shoot them in the back by the red canister or you send an explosive device round range. Room Room will be tasked with holding the one set up on pillar. He does have to be careful if you're playing that shield too closely though and an explosive lands in front of it. Not only will you take the explosive damage of that projectile, but you'll take the explosive the shield as well as the fire propagation so that's three points of damage that you can find in a matter of seconds 
we can see AG pre-establishing murder holes, those small pixel peaks with his bullet holes. And if a member of Boston is caught unaware, they might lose their life just like they have in previous rounds. Well, there's no clash. They have to stare down on the same E-Box position, but they still need to clear out this J Bunker Shield. There's going to be a player waiting around the corner. He's going to be right there waiting for Baka to make the swing. That's Chow shutting down the Ash with the Vector, going for the aggression, but that's a sniper waiting for him. Sharp cuts off the head of the Goyo. The response is swift. The rotation could not be sealed off. The kill was delivered, but Pudgy Wudgy will make sure that Boston and UCSD go one for one, keeping it even. Now in a 3v3, the two minute mark now well gone off the clock. It's gonna be up to this push and what they can get going here. They've made very good progress early on, but shutting down Alpaca, that could very well be enough for UCSD here. It's Sharp with a Sniper and a Pocket F2, and it's Omega with a 5.56 left to do it with 90 seconds left. Rubrum going for the swing. He'll be successful collecting that one. Now it's sharp against three. A quick sniper shot will be good. He lands it true. Room room now falls. And it's a closer victory, but not yet obtainable. More kills are gonna have to go for Sharp. He spots the prone angle. Shots exchanged between both players, but AG is gonna be the bigger loser. Sharp has already lost a few HP elsewhere. But the pissed on hand, AG is able to win that duel and pushing San Diego into the grand finals against Oklahoma State, who confirmed their seat earlier on. UC San Diego Grand Finals. That's where they're headed against Oklahoma State. That's definitely going to be a battle to watch. It's once again going to be the underdog story. But if UC San Diego have proven anything over these playoffs, they've proven that the underdog story is just where they belong. The 14th seed has stormed through the right side of this bracket, stormed ahead, and now they've taken down the two seed with the five seed, the only team standing in their way in the grand finals. Now, of course, the seeding, it's a little bit imbalanced. You've got strength of schedule that's not taken into account into the seeding, simply the record and the round differential. So going into the grand finals, it will absolutely be the 14th seed taking on the two seed, I mean, the five seed, excuse me, UC San Diego, Oklahoma State, Chief, I cannot wait for it. Honestly, it's going to be a phenomenal matchup. Oklahoma State looked unstoppable today. They were lethal at every turn. San Diego State had moments of brilliance. I love their attacking philosophy. Sometimes they would make a lot of mistakes in those attacks, though. But you can see in theory and on paper, they know what to do. And that is truly half of the problem. If you know what to do, then you can translate that into a victory down the road. It's going to probably make you trip, fall flat on your face one or eight times. But eventually that ninth trip, you're going to, well, stumble a little bit. That means you've learned how to walk. And eventually you'll get to that part where you're no longer crawling on the floor because you broke your nose because you fell. <laughs> well, nice. <laughs> um, we're going to be ending things here, ladies and gentlemen. It has been a fantastic night, a great double header. The first series was great. The second series was great. Great. Unfortunate for Boston, it had to end the way that it did with the player disconnecting, his PC exploding. But sometimes it does happen. Going forward, the next match, the next time you're going to see CR6 is Monday, 7 p.m. Eastern, Akron, Illinois State, Premier Invite Championship match. It's going to be a great one to turn out for. Also, incredible underdog story. It's Akron, the unbeatable team taking on ISU, a team that nobody expected to get this far. So be sure to be here Monday, 7 p.m. Eastern. But until then, I have been chief. I, I have been chief. <laughs> <laughs> I have been right, chief. Kill the kill. I We're done. Been, We're done. We're side <laughs> chief. Nope, Tango nope, Mango nope. down in the booth. Juan de Swan observing our second <laughs> match. We want to thank you all for tuning in, and we will see you next week. So long. He needs more ice cream. <laughs>
why I give you everything Held you close by the stormy seas Oh, you meant the world to me